This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 259 of the program. Today is Friday, September 25th, and before we get started, I want to take some time, as we usually do, to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Anthony Pullum, Bob McMurray, Dylan Bundy, 1111, Francis Ellis, Moki, Pilot of the Damned, Tell a Young Person to Register and Vote, and Teresa Gosnell. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So we've got a pretty loaded episode this week, so let's waste no time and get straight to it. This week on the program, we'll talk about the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and whether or not Trump will get a third Supreme Court justice confirmed before the election. And we'll also discuss whether or not Democrats will actually fight Mitch McConnell or just let him win once again. We'll also continue our coverage of the 2020 election and talk about a Joe Biden ad that's actually pretty brilliant, along with what we can expect from the upcoming debates. Also, Trump is encouraging his supporters to intimidate voters at the polls, and we'll discuss the overall toxicity that Donald Trump brings to American culture. We'll also talk about Donald Trump and Attorney General William Barr's attempt to crack down on protests even more, and Trump supporters still don't want to wear masks masks to stop the spread of COVID-19. We'll talk about that. Also, the gig economy is now trying to cash in off of the eviction crisis caused by the economic depression brought about by the global pandemic. We'll discuss that. And finally, we will close the show by talking to 2020 U.S. Senate candidate Paula Jean Swearingen from West Virginia. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's program. I hope you all enjoy the episode. Let's get right to it. On Friday, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away at the age of 87, I believe, um, and she had cancer for a very long time, and this news was uh, genuinely shocking, even if it's not necessarily surprising that someone who is old would succumb to a long-time battle with cancer. It's still like, it put a really dark cloud over the weekend, you know, not the best news to get on a Friday. Um, not just because it's sad in general, but because of the political ramifications. And for that, there's a lot. Um, I don't even know where to begin. So obviously, the question is, what's going to happen now? Who's going to replace her? Will it be Donald Trump before the election? Will it be Joe Biden? What I do know is that Democrats are not up to the challenge, and I fear for uh, what's going to happen. In fact, I'm expecting the worst. Uh, I kind of feel as if Donald Trump replacing RGB is a foregone conclusion at this point, because I just don't think Democrats know what to do. Like, immediately after RGB died, we heard that her last wish was for the next president to fill her vacancy. And, you know, I see videos of Democrats like Elizabeth Warren talking about how we need to honor her last wish. Republicans don't care. I see the videos online circulating of Mitch McConnell talking about how you can't fill a Supreme Court seat during an election year. You know, this was back in 2016. I see videos of Lindsey Graham saying the same thing, and people are kind of trying to hypocrisy burn Republicans. And I get that instinct, but I need people to understand Republicans don't care. The ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. They have absolutely no desire to convince Americans that they're principled. They just don't care. Their goal is to make sure Donald Trump fills that seat. And there's no argument that you can make to Republicans that will, you know, get them to be persuaded or pull on their heartstrings enough. Like Mitch McConnell, he is a soulless ghoul. So you're not going to like make some argument that emotionally resonates with him. He doesn't give a shit. He wants to fill that seat, and he will do just that. And so what you have to do 
is you have to block them. If you are a Democrat, you pull out every single procedural trick in the book to stop them from doing this. Everything in your power, every tool at your disposal, you use that right now because democracy is at stake. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that. Democracy is at stake. We are looking at a Supreme Court going from a 5-4 to four majority to a 6-3 to three majority. That means they have a cushion. They have some wiggle room. Everything is on the table. We're not worried about Roberts being a swing vote any longer, siding with the liberal justices, because guess what? Now they have another conservative there to back them up. So the situation is looking really, really grim. And what it seems to me is that the goal is to get the Senate to wait to confirm the next justice until after the election. Now, the election takes place on November 3rd. That's a Tuesday. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, Joe Biden does end up defeating Donald Trump and Democrats successfully delay this next appointment until after the election. Well, there's still some time where a lame duck president, Donald Trump, can confirm a justice. Like, I don't know if that's possible. Is it within the realm of possibility to where Mitch McConnell can find some way to make that happen? I feel like it's possible. Who knows? Maybe there are illegal ramifications to that. I don't know. But what I do know is that there's nothing off the table for Republicans. Nothing is off the table. They will do everything they possibly can to make sure that they fill that seat. You're not going to make an argument that's compelling enough to Mitch McConnell to get him to just unilaterally disarm from this fight. You have to fight him. And Democrats are not up to that challenge. Take a look at this interview that Nancy Pelosi did over the weekend with ABC News, George Stephanopoulos. And he asked her um, a very simple question, and her response was just bizarre. On Friday, I started their early for voting the, the day that we lost but, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But to be clear, you're not taking any arrows out of your quiver. You're not ruling anything out. Good morning. Sunday morning. The, uh, the, the, we have a responsibility. We take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. No joke. When I watched that, my reaction was, oh, my God, we're doomed. Trump's going to get this seat. Trump is going to get this seat. I just, I don't think Democrats are up to the challenge. So psychologically, I'm already kind of preparing myself for the likely scenario where Donald Trump fills that seat. He's already saying he's going to announce his pick this weekend, possibly Friday. Within an hour after RGB passed away, Mitch McConnell said, we will have a vote for this justice. Now, there is hope in maybe Lisa Murkowski, Murkowski Susan Collins, Mitt Romney, not voting with Republicans. There's a possibility that that happens. Am I optimistic about our chances there? Not necessarily because, I mean, even if it seems like Susan Collins is on the fence, she plays this game every single time and ends up going with Republicans. So polling right now shows that she's not in a good spot. So if she actually kind of sees the writing on the wall and she feels as if she's going to lose this election, this could be her parting gift to Republicans. It just, you know, whenever we hope for the best, whenever we feel as if maybe a couple of key votes will go our way, it just, it never seems to. And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm just trying to prepare people because I don't think Democrats understand what they have to do. Like, seeing them make this argument, oh, well, don't be a hypocrite, Republicans, or you're going to look bad to the American people. The American people doesn't give a shit. Republican Party voters, they don't care if Republicans are hypocrites. They want to make sure they have a comfortable majority on the Supreme Court so they can put Roe v. Wade back up on the chopping block. So that way they can put, you know, marriage equality on the chopping block. And even if you take out all of these issues related to social justice, like all of the issues with regard to regulation, the ACA, these are the ones that I think are going to be more vulnerable, right? The ACA could straight up be gutted if we have a 6-3 majority, because it seems likely that Roberts would vote with the liberal justices to save the ACA from Trump's newest legal challenge, um, you know, assuming that he he follows what he did previously. But at the same time, if you get another conservative on there, the Affordable Care Act is gone. And as shitty as that policy is, that is millions more people who lose their insurance like that. Protections for people with pre-existing conditions, they go away immediately. So there's so much at stake, 
And it, it seems like already out of the gate, um, Democrats have face planted and we need them more so than ever to fight like hell, fight like hell, use every single tool at your disposal. Does Chuck Schumer seem like he's going to be doing that? No. Do I expect him to do that? No, because he's been outmaneuvered by Mitch McConnell time and again. So, I mean, if I were Democrats, I'd be doing everything right now. But they just, they don't seem to want to fight. So look, here's the thing. This is where I'm at. I would be surprised if Trump didn't fill RGB seat. I would be surprised. Because right now, it seems like Democrats just don't have the fight in them. When I see them trying to do this campaign to honor RGB's legacy, do they honestly think that's going to suffice? Do they think Mitch McConnell is just going to have something go off in him and his heart's going to grow and think, well, you know, I should honor her legacy. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Trump doesn't care. When Trump heard that that was her last wish, he called it fake news or something to that effect. He might have literally said fake news. They don't care. You're not going to persuade them with an argument. You have to use your procedural tools, any legislative mechanism and maneuver that you have at your disposal to block it outright. Stop trying to win them over with an argument. You're not going to win over Republicans with an argument. So um, we'll see how this plays out. But I would be surprised if Democrats successfully block this. And I really, really, really want them to prove me wrong. Like I want to stand corrected and I want to be for once, just wrong about Democrats. And I want them to defy my expectations. I really hope that's going to be the case because this isn't just like normal politics. This is like literally democracy at stake. We're looking at the Lochner era on steroids. If you want to even argue that we're not already in a Lochner era. So we'll see what happens. But I have a really bad feeling about this and um, I hope I'm wrong. So Donald Trump chose to hold a rally in Ohio. I don't know why he's holding rallies in the middle of a pandemic. And there were hundreds of people in attendance. Um, this isn't a good idea. Only a few of them were wearing masks. I think that these events could act as super spreader events. I mean, they are outdoors for the most part. I know this one was. But when you have people really close next to each other, it's not a good idea. So if you want to get this pandemic under control... Not the best thing to do, uh, but I digress. Uh, he held this rally anyway, like it or not, and the lieutenant governor of Ohio, John Husted, came out to speak. And, you know, probably seeing that they weren't wearing masks, he tried to persuade the crowd to wear masks by pandering to them. Now, he brought up something that I brought up before. You know, I have repeatedly talked about how it is a huge issue that Donald Trump supporters, Republicans, conservatives, are disproportionately less likely to wear masks, right? So I don't care what kind of masks they're wearing. Like if you put on a MAGA mask, I don't care as long as you are covering your face because we have to get this pandemic under control. Um, I've said that and he actually proposed this. He has the Trump 2020 mask on, uh, but he said, look, here's the thing. If you go into a grocery store where you have to wear a mask, why don't we put on one of these Trump masks? Well, it turns out um, I underestimated the stupidity of the MAGA crowd because even a pro-Trump mask to them is out of the question because when he made this recommendation, they booed him and they booed him loudly. Take a look. But if you go into a grocery store where you got to wear one, all right, hang on, hang on, just listen up, just listen up. All right, I get it. But if somebody tells you to, t to take it off, you can at least say that you're trying to save the country by wearing one of President Donald Trump's masks, all right? All right. Even the idea of wearing a pro-Trump mask to them is out of the question. These people are deranged. This is why um, COVID-19 cases are starting to climb once again. And we were starting to see the numbers decrease from, you know, the peaks in July, but they're starting to go up again. We're seeing, what, a 10, 13% increase once again, and we have to get this under control by fall uh, or by winter. So we're not seeing COVID-19 and the flu you know, overrun and overwhelm hospitals, but they booed the idea of a pro-Trump mask. Now, 
if Trump was the one who said, listen, let's wear these pro-Trump masks. It's patriotic and we'll trigger the libs. I think that the response would be different because, again, I don't necessarily think they're following Donald Trump because of any policy reasons. This is a cult of personality. So if Daddy Trump says it, anything that Donald Trump says by definition is good. Uh, so I think that they would have accepted it if Trump said it, but because another Republican tried to use what it would only be acceptable for Daddy Trump, they did not go for it and they booed him. These people are deranged and they are a threat to all of us. Now, Trump took the stage after John Husted and he introduced the governor of uh, Ohio, Mike DeWine. Mike DeWine is a Trump sycophant. He has been loyal to Donald Trump, but... In spite of said loyalty, he actually has been attempting to handle COVID-19 like a grown-up. There is a statewide mask mandate, so you can't be indoors with more than six people without a mask. And on top of that, he actually did have some pretty stringent requirements for the quarantine. So they don't like him. Because I'm assuming a lot of them think that COVID-19 is a hoax. And they think that the mask mandate is like... I don't know, it violates their liberty or it's a muzzle or something like some of the dumb arguments that they've used. But when Trump mentioned him, they booed him. We're joined today by a real good friend of mine, somebody that's been with me from the beginning and I've been with him from the beginning, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Where's Mike? Where's Mike? Where's Mike? Where's Mike? Where's Mike? Where's Mike? that on? He's opening up. He's opening up. Where's Mike? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. He's a good man. And Lieutenant Governor John Houston. <sighs> this is just depressing to see. Because even if the Republican Party is a minority party, even if, you know, the crowd of Trump diehards that are in the MAGA cult is probably like 30, 35% at most. Well, that's still a sizable portion of the population. That's still a large enough chunk of the population to where it's going to make it really difficult for the rest of us to get it under control if that many people aren't taking it seriously. I mean, in that crowd, only a few dozen people were wearing masks. Most of them were in close quarters, not wearing masks. I mean, they were outdoors, but I mean, if you're close enough to people... Still kind of an issue, kind of a risk, a big risk. But I mean, this is not surprising. You know, the GOP has pandered to these types of people. They have cultivated this culture of anti-intellectualism and, you know, a rejection of empirical reality and facts and science. And this is what happens. You know, they reject whatever narrative is inconvenient to them and they come up with their own reasons as to why, you know, they all right, and everyone else is wrong. The science is wrong. Now, again, I still think that if Donald Trump made this recommendation to wear Trump masks, the reception would be a little bit different. But it shows you how out of control they are when loyal Republicans speaking at a Trump rally can't even make this suggestion to wear Trump masks without getting booed down. I mean, this it shows you how out of control and reckless a sizable portion of the population is. I mean, again, this isn't a majority of Americans, but it's a big enough portion that makes the rest of us more vulnerable. If we have that many people refusing to do the minimal thing to keep this virus under control, then it's going to be really difficult for us to get it under control, period. Because we have that many fucking idiots who have that big of an issue with wearing a mask. Nobody likes wearing masks. I hate wearing masks. It makes my beard look like shit afterwards. It's uncomfortable, right? It's hot. But I do it because this is what we have to do. Like, if we all wore masks, if 100% of the population wore masks, imagine how fast we'd be able to get this under control to where we wouldn't have to wear them anymore. We wouldn't have to lock down and do quarantine. But because people like this are so stupid, the rest of us have to suffer because of their fucking stupidity. And this is exactly the type of people who the GOP is appealing to. This is the culture of anti-intellectualism, pro-stupidity that Trump is trying to, you know, gin up in order to uh, help himself win re-election. <sighs> it's not surprising, but it is still deeply depressing to see this. So to me, Joe Biden's ads thus far against Donald Trump 
have been largely hit or miss. I think that anytime he goes after Donald Trump for bungling COVID-19 and the response to the pandemic, I think he does a really good job. When it comes to ads where he tries to, you know, describe what he wants to do, there's usually no policy substance. It's just platitudes. Uh, but still, I think that even like the worst Joe Biden ad is still better than the best Hillary Clinton ad. So in terms of the media game that they're playing, I think he's doing a so-so job. Um, although one ad that Joe Biden released finally resonated with me. And I like this ad so much, I kid you not. This might be my favorite political ad ever. And it's one of those ads where, you know, your opponent says something in the ad basically writes itself the attack ad writes itself well donald trump was at a rally and he said look if i lose to joe biden an idiot like joe biden i'll be so embarrassed i won't even be able to show my face again i'm paraphrasing but uh joe biden's team took that little clip and turned it into a 10 second ad and this is brilliant take a look if i lose to him i don't know what i'm gonna do i will never speak to you again you'll never see me again. i'm joe biden and i approve this message I did not think I would be doing this, but, um, <laughs> good job, Joe Biden. That is a damn good ad. Simple, um, not much effort put into it, but you don't need it. I think that this ad is, it's important because it's short, so you can run this everywhere before every single YouTube video, before, you know, um, uh, primetime television, but it also, it really speaks to something that we haven't seen from Joe Biden, and that is self-awareness, right? Because this isn't necessarily an election where people are excited about Joe Biden. Like, this is an anti-Trump election. Most people who are voting for Joe Biden are doing so because they don't like Donald Trump. So there's this tacit admission with this ad that, hey, I acknowledge that I'm not that exciting, right? But if you uh, vote for me and we beat Donald Trump, he's saying he'll go away forever. I know you don't like me, but I know that you don't like Donald Trump more. So vote for me and Donald Trump will go away forever. Like, it's it's a good ad. It's a good ad. It's self-aware. And it's exactly what you need. Like, Trump says so many idiotic things to where you could just take that small clip and make an ad like this and just put a, you know, I'm Joe Biden, I approve this message at the end, and then it's good enough. Like, Trump has been campaigning against himself, shooting himself in the foot repeatedly, to where I think that doing things like this, it's it's clever to, you know, create ads off of things like this. But on top of that, I think it's effective. I think it's effective because people are irritated with Donald Trump. People want Donald Trump to go away. Like, I get he has his cult base of diehards who will never leave him, but most of the country doesn't like Donald Trump. Remember, the Republican Party is a minority party, and even if they hold a majority of power in government, they are still a minority party. And over the last four years, even if you're like me and you hate Democrats, listening to Donald Trump, watching Donald Trump, living through a Donald Trump presidency and the Don Donald Trump era is exhausting, and I would want for nothing more than to see Donald Trump go away forever. So, you know, he's really playing on that anti-Trump sentiment in an important way. And I think this ad is good. This is one of the best ads I've ever seen. Um, and that's not saying much, right? Because the bar is really low. But at the same time, like, this is what you've got to do. People are anti-Trump. They're not pro-Biden. And, you know, if you look at public opinion polls, it's not like people are excited to support Joe Biden because of any policies. Most people probably can't name a single policy that Joe Biden is offering to voters. It's just he's not Donald Trump. He's the one person who stands between Donald Trump and another four years in the White House. So I'm voting for Joe Biden. That's the sentiment from Americans across the country. There's not much excitement, if any at all, for Joe Biden. So I'm glad that it's it's seeming like he's recognizing that and he's playing to it because it is one of his strengths. Just not being Donald Trump is a huge asset in this election. Now, that doesn't mean it's a foregone conclusion that Donald Trump will lose. I do think you have to offer people some policies. But still, like, th these types of ads, they're just damn good. They're clever. They're, you know, a little bit funny. It's charming. Damn good job, Joe Biden. Now, let's actually address whether or not Donald Trump would leave. Do I think that Donald Trump would go away? No. But so long as he doesn't have power, he will not be as politic politically relevant. So, you know, he won't create a new cycle with a single tweet or series of tweets. He just will be tweeting 
into the ether for the little cult that supports him. He can make lots of money off of his post-presidency book deals and TV shows or whatever. But I don't think he would go away. But is it nice to think about the prospect of never having to hear Donald Trump's disgusting loudmouth ever again? Yeah, it is. And this ad touches on that. So, um, look, it, it's it's surprising that I'm saying this, but Joe Biden's team put out a damn good ad. And um, if they keep doing stuff like this, where they just take Trump's own words and use it against him, um, <laughs> I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to work really well for them. Things are going to get pretty dicey in this country because on December 31st, that is the last day that people will be protected from evictions. Donald Trump's moratorium on all evictions expires. So on January 1st, millions and millions of Americans are going to be expected to pony up months of past due rent. Otherwise, what's going to happen? They're going to get evicted. And if this happens, then it's going to be a disaster to say the least. Now, if Donald Trump is reelected, I'm assuming that he's going to try to take action to either extend that moratorium if he knows what's good for him because he's not able to deal with that much chaos. He's incompetent. But if, let's say, there's the situation where Joe Biden beats him and Trump is now a lame duck president on his way out on January 20th or 21st, whenever, is he going to take action? No. He's going to leave Joe Biden with this gigantic eviction crisis, and it's going to get really ugly. It's going to lead to civil unrest. People are going to take to the streets if they have nothing to lose. If you get evicted and you have nowhere to go, you have no choice but to take to the streets and protest for action. Now look, it's not like come December 31st, all of a sudden, our economic woes will disappear. The virus will still be here. And as a result, people aren't going to have money to pay months of back rent. Like, where is this money going to come from? We haven't done anything to ameliorate this crisis, right? People aren't getting a UBI. Unemployment is through the roof. So what exactly are we going to do? And this really is an open question, and it's scary to think about what will happen. But in our late-stage capitalist society, we can't expect one thing. The private sector is going to attempt to cash in on this crisis. Because the gig economy is now going to try to take this eviction crisis and pit working people against each other. So where if you are in a situation where you're not making money and you've lost your job because of this pandemic, well, what you can do is um, work to evict your fellow Americans who have also lost everything. So as Ashwin Rodriguez of Vice reports, during a time of great economic and general hardship, civil aims to be essentially uber but for evicting people. Seizing on a pandemic-driven nosedive in employment and a huge uptick in number of people who can't pay their rent, civil aims to make it easy for landlords to hire process servers and eviction agents as gig workers. Helena Duncan, a Chicago-based paralegal who also participates in housing activism, saw a Craigslist post from civil while searching for jobs. The ad alone alarmed her. It's fucked up that there will be struggling working class people who will be drawn to gigs like furniture hauling or process serving for a company like Civil, evicting fellow working class people from their homes so they themselves can make rent, she told Motherboard. In its Craigslist ads posted across the country, Civil explains the opportunity plainly. There is plenty of work due to the dismal economy. Unemployment is at a record high and many cannot or simply are not paying rent and mortgages, the ad state. We are being contracted by frustrated property owners and banks to secure foreclosed residential properties. Civil aims to marry the gig economy with the devastation of a pandemic, complete with signature gig startup language like be your own boss and flexible hours and looking for self-motivated individuals with positive attitudes. Fastest growing money-making gig due to COVID-19, its website says. Literally thousands of process servers are needed in the coming months due to courts being backed up in judgments that needs to be served to defendants. The company at first glance appears to be some kind of Nathan for U.S. prank, sicking precarious gig jobs on vulnerable people, but Sybil is connected to a larger and real gig economy company called OnCall, which describes itself as an app that provides on-demand task services to non-urban communities beyond main city areas. OnCall is the developer behind other, more believable TaskRabbit-esque apps like LawnFixer, CleanQuick, and MoveQuick. 
given the fact that Civil is advertising all over the country and that On Call, though not popular, does exist, it seems as though Civil actually is an attempt to simplify the process of evicting people who cannot pay their rent during a pandemic. Now, had this article not included that paragraph um, saying, I know this seems satirical, but it's real, we've looked into it, I probably wouldn't be talking about this because me just like seeing this headline, I thought, no, there's no way. It's either clickbait or, you know, they're being duped by some sort of hoax or like, I don't know, some, I don't know, like it, this can't be real. That was my takeaway. There's no way this is real. I mean, even for our late stage capitalist economy, um, there's, there's no way that a company would stoop this low, right? It has to be fake. It's real. What do you even say to that? Do I think people would go for this if they were desperate enough and they knew about this and this could be a lucrative opportunity for them? I mean, look, if it comes down to it and you have to choose between making sure that there's a roof over your head versus someone else, you know, you're going to look out for... Number one, you're going to look out for your family. And if that means, you know, you're you're going to have to evict other people, I'm sure a lot of people may opt for that as an option because they're desperate. When you get desperate, you resort to really crazy things, right? So this company is pitting the working class against each other and they're profiting off of it. Something like this in our late-stage capitalist society is even shocking to people like me who talk frequently about the depravity of our late stage culture, late stage capitalist culture. Like, you think that there's some limit, right? But there's not a limit. Like, in the event, we started to literally see the apocalypse come about. If we're not already there, there's going to be some way that capitalists will try to make money off of it. If there's an asteroid headed our way, um, you know, they're going to sell lifeboats to rich people. If, you know, um, there's a revolution in the streets, there's going to be security firms that sell protection to people. Like, there's going to be some attempt to make money so long as we live in this late-stage capitalist society. It's just, it's morally depraved, it's disturbing, but I mean... This is what we've come to expect. Like, we are a country that hasn't done jack-fucking-shit for people during an economic depression and a pandemic. We gave people a one-time payment of $1,200, and that's it. Does anyone even think that there's going to be another stimulus check before this election? Before the end of the year? We've done nothing. We've responded to COVID-19 and the economic depression that resulted because of said pandemic in a way that we'd expect a failed state to respond, like our government just isn't functioning. Normal governments won't just sit idly by as almost 40 million Americans could be evicted come January 1st. Like, this isn't a normal response. It's not healthy for a developed country with the most money in the world to just let people suffer. And then you see things like this happen. So now the gig economy, which wouldn't even be a thing if people weren't already desperate in the first place, is now going to um, pit working class people against each other by, you know, getting them to evict one another and make money off of that to survive. It's like a dog-eat-dog -dog world in, you know, the most literal sense where, you know, you literally have to harm your fellow working class citizens in order to survive that's that's where we're at and i don't know how many people are going to go for this but it's fucking disgusting and i don't know like i don't really have the words i'm still shocked that this is a thing and there's a part of me that's still hoping that this is satire and we're all being duped but is it really that unbelievable in a late stage capitalist society no, unfortunately, no. So we've talked about Marjorie Greene on the program before. For those of you who don't remember, this is a congressional candidate running in Georgia's 14th congressional district, and she recently won her primary. She was running against a still extreme, albeit less 
cuckoo Republican. Uh, he lost, and this individual is almost certainly going to be going to Congress, not just because this is a deeply red district, so if you win the Republican primary, you basically get that seat, but her Democratic opponent just dropped out not too long ago. And if you're not familiar with who Marjorie Greene is and what she represents, let me refresh your memory or introduce you to her. Um, and I'm sorry if you were living in ignorant bliss, but this is what she's all about. I'm Marjorie Greene and I approve this ad. America is the greatest country in the world. We need conservatives in Washington that will keep it that way. I'm running to stop gun control. Open borders. The Green New Deal. And socialism. Democrats fight for their socialist agenda every single day. I'll fight even harder to stop them. I'm Marjorie Green, Republican for Congress. Save America, stop socialism. President Trump declared Antifa a domestic terrorist organization. I have a message for Antifa terrorists. Stay the hell out of Northwest Georgia. You won't burn our churches, loot our businesses, or destroy our homes. I'm Marjorie Green, and I approve this message. Yeah, it's like indistinguishable from satire. Like 10, 20 years ago, if you would have showed me a skit from like Saturday Night Live or The Onion, um, you know, where they're trying to make fun of Republicans and be overly hyperbolic, I think that they do something like that. But now like what I would have previously thought would have been satirical, it's so loony, is now the reality. And this is an individual who isn't just going to be going to Congress. She's a rising star in the Republican Party. She is a rising star in the Republican Party. This is a member of QAnon, a conspiracy theory group, and that's not me attacking her. She openly embraces the label herself. On top of that, Donald Trump tweeted about her. People are really looking to her as a future leader in the Republican Party. And I mean, given how far to the right this party has shifted, uh, you know, embracing people like her, it's not that surprising. But still, I mean, when you compare her to someone like Mitt Romney. I mean, the difference is night and day. Um, and I hate Mitt Romney. So, I mean, this is like a new low even for the Republican Party, but yet I'm afraid this will be the new normal. But anyways, the reason why we're talking about Marjorie Greene is because she will be going to Congress and she is already preemptively attacking one of her colleagues, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And for whatever reason, she decided to take a shot at AOC because she thinks that AOC is not intelligent. So she tweeted out, as a blonde woman, I would like to take a moment to thank Congresswoman AOC. She has single handedly, I think she means handedly, put an end to all dumb blonde jokes. Blondes everywhere appreciate your service and your sacrifice. Now, this is weird, like it came out of nowhere. This is your future colleague who you're attacking for no reason. I mean, I guess you don't care that the workplace is going to be a little awkward next year. Uh, but I mean, she attacked AOC out of the blue. And she was so proud of this, she pinned this tweet to her Twitter feed. So, I mean, if you are going to be going to Congress, you think that you would be, you know, staying focused, you know, crafting your agenda, trying to let people know what you are going to be fighting for. But this person, I mean, she's just a Trump sycophant. If you go to her website, she doesn't really have any policy proposals, but she says, I back Trump 100%. So if Trump loses this election, then what do you stand for? You're just going to go there and keep the seat warm? Like people like this, I don't know why you run for Congress if you literally don't stand for anything. And you're attacking AOC because you think that she's stupid. You're a member of QAnon. You think it's morally and legally justifiable to kill Black Lives Matter protesters who you deem Antifa and you're criticizing somebody else's intelligence level. Now, after she threatened to extrajudicially murder Black Lives Matter protesters, well, since she was inciting violence, Facebook took down her post and she then took to social media and cried about how she was being censored and her First Amendment rights are being violated. If you think that a private company deleting one of your videos where you're inciting violence is you losing your First Amendment right, you are the one who's stupid, not AOC. You are the one who uh, doesn't know anything 
about the Constitution, which you are supposed to be uh, protecting if you're a member of Congress. But regardless, AOC basically had the best response. And what she said here made me laugh out loud. So she said, don't worry, Miss Green. I completely understand why you need to swing plus miss at my intellect to make yourself feel better. You seem to have some trouble spelling your own insults correctly. Next time, try single-handedly. <laughs> It'll work better. Good luck writing legislation. <laughs> That was good. That was really, really good. Um, I mean, look, if you're going to say, I don't agree with this policy that you're proposing, okay, you can have that disagreement and debate about it, but you're criticizing her intelligence. Like, this is your future colleague. Again, it's so weird that you would do this. This is bizarre, right? And I'm not one to stress about the need to uphold decorum. I don't care about civility politics and respectability politics. I don't care about that, but this is this is bizarre. This is immature. And you're criticizing her just out of the blue saying, hey, you're stupid. Huh? Let me pin this tweet to my uh, Twitter feed. It, it's bizarre and weird. And if you're going to criticize somebody's intelligence, at least make sure that you get the fucking tweet right and you say single-handedly instead of single-handedly. Now, generally speaking, I don't care if somebody makes a typo. Usually you can put two and two together, fill in the blanks, figure out what they're trying to say. But you're trying to say that someone else is dumb but you're making yourself look like a dumbass as you tweet to her. Like, if you're going to say somebody else is stupid, at least get the tweet right. So I'm I'm loving this tweet from AOC. But of course, Marjorie Greene responded to that saying, AOC, please, no one cares about typos. While you were growing up in socialist boot camp, I don't even know what that means, I was creating thousands of jobs, $250 million in revenue in 11 different states. Your Marxist Green New Deal will destroy millions of jobs, and I'm going to put it through the paper shredder. Okay, so now she's changing the subject because she made a fool out of herself. So, you you know, she's trying to argue that AOC is stupid, but she made herself look like a dumbass. So now she's just saying, oh, well, nobody cares about typos. But you just said that, you know, you really are thankful that AOC is so stupid because the dumb blonde joke is no longer relevant. But you're kind of disproving your own tweet. How can you say someone else is dumb if you can't even insult their intelligence level in even a mildly competent way. And then when she says, well, you know, maybe it's not me who's the dumbass, maybe it's you, you say, oh, well, nobody cares about typos. But you implied that you do if you were concerned with her intelligence. Like, you're just a psychopath. Like, why are you going to Congress? Like, you don't stand for anything. You don't know a single policy that you want. You're just with Trump 100%. Like, what does that even mean? And you say that she went through a uh, socialist boot camp. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? That she went through college? That she has a degree? I don't know what that means. If anyone goes to college, does that mean that we've gone through socialist boot camp? I don't understand what that means. And she says that the Green New Deal is Marxist. The Green New Deal is Marxist? Do you know what that means? Do you know what Marxism means? How is a Green New Deal going to destroy millions of jobs when the entire point of the Green New Deal is to subsidize and invest in renewable technology instead of fossil fuels. Like wind, solar, hydro, these are all the future. Like this technology is what we should be investing in because climate change is a reality. So what AOC is doing with the Green New Deal is saying, hey, rather than, you know, letting China or some other country be the number one manufacturer of this technology that will be the future, why don't we actually do that here so we can create jobs and also stop climate change uh, in the process. But you're saying, oh, no, 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 this thing that you support that's going to create millions of jobs is actually going to destroy millions of jobs because I don't know what it is. And on top of that, I think it's Marxist because anything that I don't like is Marxist. I mean, do you even understand the terms that you're throwing around? Like you call people Marxist, communists, when the people who you're attacking oftentimes these are neoliberals. They're free market capitalists. The Democratic Party is not a socialist party, but she accuses them of being socialist and whatnot. And her entire thing is to go to Congress to stop socialism. That's another part of her agenda. Stop socialism, save America. Except, do you even know what socialism is? Like, I just don't understand how someone like this, who is not a serious person, can run a successful congressional campaign and get elected to Congress. And still, not even try to play the part. I mean, everything in this country is so stupid right now, and Marjorie Greene is an embarrassment. But she is one of those Republicans who has no shame. Like, she's in her weird little conspiracy cult slash bubble. And, you know, as long as the people around her like what she's doing, as long as she gets likes 
from, you know, the far right, then she's happy with it. But if she looks like a clown to the overwhelming majority of the country, she doesn't care. Um, so it's, it's embarrassing, but this is what we're working with. Like the Republican party is going to continue to produce figures like Marjorie Taylor Greene because they're shifting to the right. Like 10 years ago, they were trying to really explicitly go after people like this. And now they're going to represent a solid portion of your party. So, uh, you know, even if other Republicans are condemning her and saying she's even a little bit extreme for us. This is what happens when you appeal to these types of people. This is what you get. And now she's going to go to Congress. Um, so, yeah, I'm really glad that she chose to interact with AOC. If you're going to take a shot, don't miss. And in this instance, she missed and she face planted. Well, 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 it turns out Mitt Romney isn't actually a loyal member of the resistance after all. Shocker. Now, listen, he announced that he will, in fact, be siding with Republicans to move forward with Donald Trump's Supreme Court nominee. And, you know, if you are heartbroken by this because you thought maybe he'd do the right thing after voting to impeach Donald Trump, after being the only Republican senator to vote to impeach Donald Trump, I mean, you should never expect anything good to come from the Republican Party. Republicans are going to Republican, okay? Um, anytime there's an open question about whether or not they will do the right thing, you should always be cynical. You should never be optimistic because this party is a terrible party and Mitt Romney is a horrible human being who is a political opportunist. So he's not voting with Democrats unless it's going to benefit him. Now, I don't actually blame liberals for thinking that maybe there is a chance that Mitt Romney might side with them because there were reports coming out that Mitt Romney might actually be chosen by Joe Biden to be part of the administration, a secretary of state or something like that. Now, that's disgusting. The fact that maybe Joe Biden is considering that should make everyone outraged. However, if that were true, which maybe now I'm assuming it's not true, it's not unreasonable to think, you know, maybe Mitt Romney out of self-interest, not wanting to piss off his boss next year, might vote with the Democratic Party just because it's the right thing to do, since Republicans are the ones who set that precedent in 2016, saying we're not going to approve a Supreme Court nominee during an election year. But I mean, Mitt Romney didn't come through. So look, if you are hoping that this is going to be stopped because enough Republicans are going to, uh, you know, have the courage to do the right thing, it's not going to happen. Democrats now have to fight. They can't rely on Republicans to do the right thing, even Republicans in, uh, you know, vulnerable seats in swing states. So that means Democrats, if they actually are serious about this, will use every single procedural tool that they have at their disposal to block this, to obstruct this, to do everything that they can to raise hell to make sure that this does not happen. We cannot allow Donald Trump to get a third Supreme Court nominee because that means that the conservative majority on that court will be 6-3. That means everything is on the table. It's already the case that collective bargaining rights, workers' rights, that's already going to be gutted. The ACA will officially be gutted if we have another Supreme Court nominee because Roberts isn't going to be the swing vote to side with the liberals on the court. Now they'll have a cushion. They'll have a 6-3 solid majority, and that means they could even repeal the ACA, which is a garbage program to begin with. But if they repeal that, that's a disaster. That means that protections for patients with pre-existing conditions vanish like that. That means that um, anyone who has insurance through the Affordable Care Act exchanges loses that. We're talking about tens 20 million people potentially, it's a disaster. So Democrats have to fight with everything that they've got because democracy is at stake here. Even social issues, abortion, marriage equality, these are all on the table if they have a 6-3 majority. They can do anything they want for decades, reshape this country for a generation or two. So they have to stop this. And I'm not seeing many signs of life from the Democratic Party. Admittedly, I'm not very optimistic. It seems as if Donald Trump will in fact get his way. Now, to his credit, Chuck Schumer did try to implement a legislative tool to uh, limit hearings to two hours. Other Democrats, such as Maggie Hassan, were complaining about this. I mean, it's, it's a sign that maybe he's willing to try something, but I just, I'm not feeling very optimistic. It's up to Democrats. But thankfully, there are some Democrats who want to fight. 
but uh, I don't think enough are. Now, Ed Markey came out swinging expectedly, saying Mitch McConnell set the precedent. No Supreme Court vacancies filled in an election year. If he violates it, when Democrats control the Senate in the next Congress, we must abolish the filibuster and expand the Supreme Court. And this is exactly what I want to hear, because it seems like now, like I'm not saying they should give up. It seems like Trump's going to get his way. Mitch McConnell is going to make this happen. So if this is going to happen, then I hope that what Chuck Schumer means by saying nothing is off the table next year is that he's open to this. He's open to abolishing the filibuster and stacking the court. Democracy is at stake. You can't allow a Lochner era on steroids to take place at a time when we are facing climate catastrophe, when Americans could lose their health insurance. I mean, if you allow this, then you don't deserve to be in power. You should resign in shame. So what Ed Markey is saying here, this is what I want to hear. Nothing is going to be ruled out if this happens because we have to save our democracy. We can't let this happen. We can't let them steal two Supreme Court seats. It's unacceptable. Now, um, this idea is something that was um, mulled over by the media. And one Democrat in particular, who is horrible, Dianne Feinstein, responded and as NBC News reporter Sahil Kapoor explains, Feinstein on ending the filibuster and expanding SCOTUS. Quote, I don't believe in doing that. I think the filibuster serves a purpose. It is not often used. It's often less used now than when I first came. And I think it's part of the Senate that differentiates itself. Now, this um, is outrageous. So what Dianne Feinstein is doing is effectively siding with Republicans. She's saying, you know what? Still... One, two Supreme Court seats from us, and we are going to just let you have it because uh, we have to uphold these uh, Senate norms. We're not going to do anything that might upset the status quo. I mean, Dianne Feinstein, I don't know how she sleeps at night. This is a terrible human being who doesn't care about anyone but herself. How could you literally just admit, I'm siding with Republicans. I might not vote for Donald Trump's nominee. But um, if it comes time to actually fight and stop that damage from a third Donald Trump nominee from being caused, I'm not going to do jack fucking shit. I'm not going to end the filibuster. We're not going to pack the court. <sighs> it's just, it's exhausting. Because, you know, the minute that we learned about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, I just thought, this is, uh, this is not going to go well for Democrats. They just... They don't know how to fight. They're fully incapable of trying to even know how to outmaneuver Republicans in the slightest. Mitch McConnell knows exactly what he needs to do to get this through. And that's anything. He doesn't give a shit if it makes him look like a hypocrite. He's going to ram this nominee through, get it uh, confirmed as soon as possible. And Democrats are just sitting idly by and they're wagging their fingers. In fact, that's exactly what uh, Dianne Feinstein decided to do because she doesn't want to end the filibuster or pack the court. But I'm sure that, you know, this strongly worded tweet to Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell is going to change things for the Democrats. She tweeted out, Leader McConnell set the standard for Supreme Court nominations in an election year in 2016. Let the next president nominate a replacement. Under no circumstances should the Senate consider a nominee for Justice Ginsburg's seat until after the presidential inauguration. I mean, that's just, that's brilliant, Dianne Feinstein. I'm sure that Mitch McConnell is going to see that and he's going to be trembling. He's going to think, oh my God, Dianne Feinstein put out this strongly worded tweet, so I can't go forward with this. It's exhausting. And just reading the news about this, it's hard to not like feel completely overwhelmed and demoralized because these are our fighters. Our best chance at stopping this from happening is a bunch of incompetent clowns who are too afraid to fight or don't care. Now, someone who actually, thankfully, has been fighting, who's saying what I'm saying, that Democrats have to use every single procedural tool under their belt, is AOC. And she actually, thankfully, blasted Dianne Feinstein for refusing to um, actually fight fire with fire. So she responded to Dianne Feinstein's initial statement about not wanting to pack the quarter and the filibuster, 
And she said, Senator Feinstein's protection of the filibuster is unjust and unacceptable. The filibuster wasn't made with purpose. It's the result of an accident in rulebook revision and bloomed as a cherished tool of segregationists. Now it empowers minority rule. That's not special. It's unjust. And I'm so thankful that she actually had the courage to call out a fellow Democrat. But what she's saying here is so true. Like, we don't say enough how outrageous it is that a minority party, the Republican Party, is in control of a majority of government, and they are absolutely steering this country in a direction where a majority of its people don't want to go. Most Americans want Roe v. Wade. They want legal abortions, even if personally they wouldn't get an abortion themselves, because they're at least, you know, logical enough to acknowledge that if you get rid of abortions, that's not going to stop abortions. It'll just increase the number of unsafe and illegal abortions that take place. And if you're worried about death, then maybe you should start being concerned with all the wars that our lawmakers keep sending us to, right? All the drone strikes that Donald Trump is approving. Um, so, you know, for this party to continue to be in control and keep getting their way, and you have this opposition party just sit back and do fuck all about it. It's just, it's infuriating. But at the same time, I get fired up because I'm angry. But then I just feel exhausted a moment later. I mean, this, we shouldn't have to keep fighting for our lives every fucking time anything happens. It's like whenever something happens, someone resigns from the Supreme Court, um, something politically happens, some big event we always have to worry, will Democrats fight for us? There should never be a question. They should just do it because we elect them to fight for us. And yet they don't do that. If they're not sitting on their asses, then they are actively discouraging fighting fire with fire. You have Dianne Feinstein's dumbass saying, no, we're not going to get rid of the filibuster. No, we're not going to pack the Supreme Court. Well, why don't you just switch sides, become a Republican? Because you're more useful to them than you are to us at this point, Diane. <sighs> So as you can see, I'm a little bit uh, irritated because this should be something that should come naturally to Democrats. If they genuinely cared, if they had a buy-in to democracy, then they would know what's at stake. But the fact that we have to scream at the top of our lungs to get them to do anything, it's just, it's infuriating and I'm so fucking sick of it. Fight! That's why you're there. Dianne Feinstein is 167 years old. You chose to run for another term. If you didn't want to fight any longer, then you shouldn't have ran. You shouldn't have sought re-election if you were just going to sit on your ass the entire fucking time. But you're there now. You got elected. So fight. What are you doing? But I'll leave that there because I feel like if I keep um, ranting, I'm just going to get meaner and meaner and end up insulting them more. So um, we'll leave that there. Um, at least... Some Democrats, like Ed Markey and AOC, are willing to fight, but most of them, I just don't think that they've got it in them. And if uh, this happens, if Trump actually gets his way, then they should absolutely pay for not fighting hard enough. They should face the repercussions of their inaction. They should be primaried and lose their elections. So on Monday, Attorney General William Barr made the absolutely bizarre decision to designate cities such as New York City, Seattle, and Portland as anarchist jurisdictions. Now, what this is, is a cynical and nefarious plot to further criminalize these protests and penalize cities where these protests continue to take place. But on top of that, if you think about this, if Joe Biden and the Democrats play their cards right, they could frame this as a self-own. Because Donald Trump, his own attorney general, is saying, under our watch, certain cities have devolved into chaos to the extent that we are willing to designate them as anarchist jurisdictions. Doesn't that show that you're pretty feckless as a leader? Now, I don't even know if that strategy is worthwhile since nobody's really going to believe that these cities are run by anarchists, but regardless, they're going through with this. And Natasha Leonard of The Intercept kind of explains what's at stake here and what could happen with this new designation in an article for The Intercept titled, Welcome to the Anarchist Jurisdiction of New York, where cops crush every tiny protest. Bill Barr's designation of Seattle, Portland, and New York is a cynical Trump re-election ploy with potentially dangerous consequences. And in this piece, she explains, on Saturday night, the New York Police Department arrested nearly a third of a 300-person protest. Demonstrators had gathered in Times Square to call for the abolition of U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, better known as ICE. The 
The protesters did no more than march and chant. They stayed on the sidewalk. Police outnumbered them three to one. One demonstrator told CNN that officers descended from all sides and started ripping people off of the sidewalk. There were 86 arrests. In the preceding days, small protest after small protest in New York had been crushed by overwhelming police force and aggressive arrests. Alongside Seattle and Portland, New York City earned the official anarchist jurisdiction label from Attorney General Bill Barr on Monday. Other cities under Democratic leadership are likely to be added to this farce of a naughty list, targeting areas where potent anti-racist, anti-fascist protests have erupted this summer. The designations are the latest act in President Donald Trump's theater of the absurd. Because of the designation, the localities now stand to lose significant federal funding. There's no subtlety in Trump's cynical base pandering, aided once again by Barr's Justice Department in service as the president's private law firm. Residents of New York, Seattle, and Portland responded with bemusement on social media when they learned that their cities, heavily policed, viciously unequal, racially segregated terminals and repositories of capital are in fact anarchist jurisdictions. New York City hasn't been an anarchist jurisdiction since CBGB closed, man, quipped comedian and writer Josh Gondelman on Twitter. Reminder, in this anarchist jurisdiction, alternate side parking rules are in effect, tweeted MSNBC's David Gura. There was some heady riffing on whether the horizontalist, anti-hierarchical nature of anarchist organizing makes anarchist jurisdiction an oxymoron. The city is ours, anarchist jurisdiction, Brooklyn-based anarchist community center, the base, mockingly tweeted. Yet, the material consequences for residents in the designated cities could be all too real. White House Budget Director Russ Vaught is set to issue guidance to federal agencies on withdrawing funds from the cities in less than two weeks. In no uncertain terms, Trump is punishing cities that have again and again Again, shown themselves to be hubs of anti-racist, anti-fascist resistance. The Justice Department may well have to defend this jaundiced, cynical move in court, but the work it's meant to do has been done. The fortification of escalating efforts to repress dissent, building on Trump and his Justice Department's ongoing campaign strategy of groundlessly demonizing Antifa while decimating black lives. Yeah, so I mean, in essence, people are making fun of this because it's not happening. I don't know anyone who actually believes that these cities are run by anarchists or that there's just sheer chaos and anarchy in these cities because there's protests. If there's protests, that's a sign that democracy is still in effect. It's a good thing, right? It's kind of like the saying that, you know, if you're feeling pain, that means you're still alive. So that's a good thing. Well, the fact that we see protests, people taking to the streets for Black Lives Matter, that's a good thing. It shows that democracy is working if people can redress their grievances. But it's a way for Donald Trump and his cronies to uh, demonize protesters and criminalize protesters with extra penalties um, by punishing states and localities that allow for it. Now, I think that Pramila Jayapal had a really good response to this. She says, this is not just unlawful, but it's also a prime example of this president's failed leadership and desperation. Amidst COVID-19's devastation, people need more relief, not less. Yet, Trump would prefer to turn your attention away from real crises by fear-mongering and fanning racism. And she's exactly right. Like, this is nothing more than Donald Trump beating his chest, you know, attempting to appear tough so he can scream law and order. It's an attempt to pander to his base. Uh, but it does have really devastating consequences. It is brazenly unconstitutional for one. Because basically, they're trying to disincentivize protests by punishing these cities. Sending a message to these cities like Seattle and Portland that, hey, if you don't get these protests under control, we're going to designate them as anarchist jurisdictions and you're going to lose funding. It doesn't matter that you need more funding than ever to deal with a global pandemic, but we're going to penalize you. So get them under control. Now, it's unconstitutional because you can't take funding away from cities if their residents choose to express their First Amendment rights and protest. I don't care what your bullshit reasoning is. There's no such thing as anarchist jurisdictions in the United States of America. So for you to say, if this takes place, you lose funding, you're literally just penalizing cities where protests happen. It's an attempt to criminalize democracy and protesting. And it's disgusting. Now, if you don't live in one of these anarchist jurisdictions, as I do, uh, well, you too could see 
more attempts by Republicans to criminalize protests because Florida Governor Ron DeSantis tweeted this out. Today, I announced bold legislation that creates new criminal offenses and increases penalties for those who target law enforcement and participate in violent or disorderly assemblies. We will always stand with our men and women in uniform who keep our communities safe. Now, these harsher penalties, I mean, we know what this is about. This is meant to deter people from protesting, even if they're specifically referring to riots here and property damage. We already know this will be subject to abuse as curfew laws are. But this is what should concern you the most. There's a couple of provisions here that they want to get through that are just downright insane. So you could lose your entire livelihood if, quote, convicted of participating in a violent or disorderly assembly. And what's deemed violent or disorderly is entirely up to the discretion of police officers who are definitely unbiased. And if you're convicted, you could lose your unemployment benefits, your food stamps. So understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to dissuade people from protesting if they're poor. Because if you end up showing up to one of these protests, you could lose everything if they say your protest is too disorderly. Now, oftentimes these protests are perfectly peaceful, but it's the police who disrupt. They, you know, throw a tear gas canister into a crowd to disrupt the crowd. And then since people are panicking, all hell breaks loose. They then uh, say that's a disorderly crowd. People get arrested. And uh, what are you doing? You're effectively criminalizing protests. So even if you're a peaceful protest, like nobody thinks that this isn't going to be open up to abuse. Like even if you are peaceful and you don't plan on rioting or looting or doing anything negative that they're fearmongering about, you can still be penalized because, I mean, is it really that out of the question to assume that cops may lie about what you're doing? We saw people snatching uh, peaceful protesters off of the streets in Portland. Trump's thugs throwing them in vans, kidnapping people. So, I mean, if you are skeptical about how this is going to be used and it's not just going to be applied to people who are, you know, protesting violently, I think you're a reasonable person. Now, the worst clause here in this, it should shock everyone. So if you block a road, that is now a third degree felony, but what is being proposed will literally promote vigilante acts of terrorism. Because... If a crowd of people are blocking traffic um, and a driver wants to plow through said crowd of people, well, quote, the driver is not liable for injury or death caused if fleeing for safety from a mob. So in other words, if some far-right chud doesn't like the Black Lives Matter protests and he decides to just drive his car straight into these protesters, which the right has celebrated before with compilation videos, where they, you know, uh, play it with music, you know, uh, remixes of Ludacris' move. They're safe. They just have to say, look, I uh, saw this mob and I was fleeing, so I had to get away. I had no choice but to plow into them. This is literally a law that is incentivizing terrorist attacks. So after Charlottesville, the right-wing terrorist who drove his car into a crowd of people and ended up killing Heather Heyer. Under this law, he could potentially be exempt as long as he uses the defense. Look, I saw a mob. I had to flee. I felt intimidated. This law allows that person to commit that terror attack legally. The Republican Party, they're not just doing things now openly that are profoundly undemocratic. They're openly authoritarian openly authoritarian at all levels at the national level we see what donald trump and attorney general william barr are doing bill barr literally instructed police in dc to gas peaceful protesters so trump could take a photo op we see now states run by right-wing goons saying look we're going to do more tough on crime laws. And also we're going to disincentivize certain types of protests by saying that if you're hit by a car, like if you're targeted by a far right thug, they're not going to be liable for your death or injury. The Republican Party, you know, if we don't call them fascist, anyone who's afraid to use the F word, 
they're doing a disservice to America because this is fascism. This is fascism. The Republican Party is very openly embracing authoritarianism, attempting to penalize peaceful protests across the country, and we're just sitting back and letting this happen? It's, uh, it's really, uh, it's scary because this is a democracy. We should be allowed to protest. But if you protest too long in certain states, Trump's administration will declare your city an anarchist jurisdiction. And if you uh, block a street, if you know you protest in the street, well, they say in Florida, if this law passes, if you obstruct traffic, the driver's not liable if he chooses to, to you know drive through you and kill you. This is insane. I don't know how else to describe it. And it's a new low, even for the Republican Party. They're no longer just proto-fascists. They now are openly embracing violence. Just the other day at a campaign rally, Donald Trump said it was a beautiful sight when a journalist, Ali Velshi of MSNBC, was shot by police with a tear gas canister. And the crowd cheered. They loved it. They are openly embracing violence and authoritarianism. If you're not worried about what's to come, if they keep on this path and don't change this trajectory soon, then I don't know what to say. You're just not paying attention. This should shake everyone to their cores. Before Donald Trump's postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, said that he would not be doing any changes to the Postal Service until after the election, you know, one other thing that worried me, another implication of Trump's attacks on mail-in voting, or I should say his lies on, you know, mail-in voting, is that this could encourage his supporters to take action themselves. If he works them into a frenzy and they're hysterical about mail-in voting and they are expecting fraud, this could lead to voter intimidation. Where if he says, look, you've got to watch out because there's going to be a lot of people committing fraud and cheating and possibly voting illegally, then what's going to happen? With the emergence of far-right militias across the country in response to Black Lives Matter protests, it's not going to be too surprising if we see that pop up at the polls. If they think somebody is being a little bit too suspicious or is a little bit too brown to be a legal citizen, maybe they take action. Maybe they intimidate or harass that individual. Now, this hasn't officially happened yet, but if Trump keeps doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying and encouraging what he's encouraging, then uh, we could be looking at a disaster come election time when these groups do pop up. Now, again, this is speculation because... We haven't actually seen um, anyone take up arms and guard polling stations, if you will, for lack of a better word. But what we did catch was a glimpse of this possibly happening when um, early voting started in Virginia and Trump supporters showed up to protest. So as the New York Times reports, Trump supporters disrupt early voting in Virginia. A group waving Trump flags and chanting four more years created a commotion at a polling location in Fairfax, Virginia. A county official said some voters and staff members felt intimidated. Now we'll just pause there before we dive into the article. Um, That was the goal. Mission accomplished. Like you can argue Maybe these people just showed up because they were excited about early voting and they were enthusiastic about Donald Trump and they just wanted to, you know, express that enthusiasm. But do we really think that's happening? Should we be that charitable in our interpretation after Donald Trump for months has been fear-mongering and lying about mail-in voting and voting in general that the left is going to cheat and Democrats are going to cheat? I mean, I think we know what these people wanted to do. They wanted to send a message to people showing up to vote. A message that was pretty clear. We're watching you. If you're going to cheat, we're watching you. Now, some people may be conflict averse and, you know, might get awkward and be a little bit intimidated by that. And because you show a certain look on your face because you're scared seeing all these lunatics protest at a polling station, um, maybe they think, hey, you look suspicious. Why are you afraid? You have no reason to be afraid. I mean, this could lead to harassment. And it's happening because of Donald Trump. Now, for this specific situation, there's been a little bit of misinformation that has been spread. Some people think that they were blocking people from entering the polling booth, uh, but that's not actually what took place. 
based on this article and what they're reporting. So they explained county election officials eventually were forced to open up a larger portion of the Fairfax County Government Center to allow voters to wait inside away from the Trump enthusiasts. Election officials said that the group stayed about 100 feet from the entrance to the building and, contrary to posts on social media, were not directly blocking access to the building. But they acknowledged that some voters and polling staff members felt intimidated by what some saw as protesters. Citizens coming into and leaving the building did have to go by them, Gary Scott, the general registrar of Fairfax County, said in a statement. Those voters who were in line outside of the building were moved inside and we continued operations. Some voters and election staff did feel intimidated by the crowd and we did provide escorts past the group. One of the escorts was the county executive. So even if we're kind to them, the effect that they had, even if it was unintentional, was negative. People felt intimidated. Rightfully so. I mean, if you have to open up a certain area so voters can get away from these people who are causing a commotion at a polling station, that's a problem. Regardless of what their intentions were, and I'm being a lot more charitable than I should be, I think, um, the result was negative. But this is basically um, the least of my concerns with what Donald Trump supporters could possibly do if this continues. Um, and I'll tell you why it's happening. Because Donald Trump continues to tell his supporters, the other side is going to cheat. I want you, my supporters, to watch them. He did this just the other day. He said they're going to cheat. It's not about if they cheat. It's when they're going to cheat. It's a certainty. So get your friends, get your family, get your neighbors, get your co-workers, get everybody, and get out and vote. Got to get out and vote. And in your state, in Ohio, early voting has already begun, and don't wait. And when you see them cheating on the other side, I don't say if, when. When you see them cheating with those ballots, all of those unsolicited ballots, those millions of ballots, you see them, Anytime you do, report them to the authorities. The authorities are waiting and watching. That is deeply, deeply disturbing. Voter intimidation like this sort of thing is what we see and expect from uh, dictatorships. Autocrats in authoritarian regimes. But we're seeing it here in America. Now, back in June, the Washington Post did an analysis of mail-in voting. And do you want to know what the fraud rate is? For mail-in voting? 0.0025%. So all of this commotion, fear-mongering he's causing is over 0.0025%. Now, what's especially disturbing is he's telling his voters to expect the other side to cheat but he's not even very specific. So you're encouraging people to look out for cheaters, but they don't even know what they're supposed to be looking out for. Are you alleging that there's going to be like people bringing in suitcases full of ballots to vote multiple times? What are you insinuating that they should be looking for? Do you understand why this is dangerous? Because you have imbeciles who are going to, at the behest of Donald Trump's wish, show up to polling stations and maybe try to intimidate people. You could have a far-right militia wave guns in voters' faces, letting them know if you cheat, there's going to be ramifications for your actions, and they don't even know what they're looking for. What's that? You are uh, brown or black? Are you a legal citizen? Do you have any papers? Like, do you understand what they're going to do if this does actually come to fruition, if Donald Trump gets what he wants? Like, what we're seeing with them protesting... That's like the least of what we should be concerned with, even if it is a nuisance. What I'm worried about is outright voter intimidation from far-right thugs that we are seeing become more and more prevalent across the country. Now, in saying all of this, Donald Trump, again, is reinforcing this idea that it's us versus them, right? He's reinforcing this idea that we are good and the other side is evil. And, you know, it's not just Democrats who are the enemy to, uh, you know, MAGA chuds. It's also the media because at another rally, he literally celebrated the fact that Ali Velshi of MSNBC, when he was covering the Minneapolis protests, was shot by police with a tear gas canister. He made fun of that and said it was a glorious sight. 
And um, there's something even more disturbing about that. See if you could pick it up when you watch this. I remember this guy, Welchie, he got hit on the knee with a canister of tear gas and he went down. He didn't, he was down. My knee, my knee. Nobody cared. These guys didn't care. They moved them aside. And they just walked right through. It was like, it was the most beautiful thing. No, because after we take all that crap, for weeks and weeks, they would take this crap, and then you finally see men get up there and go right through. Did, wasn't it really a beautiful sight? Yeah. Huh? It's called Law and Order. Law and Order. It was a beautiful thing, the president said, of police assaulting a journalist. Now, the more disturbing thing that I hope you picked up on was the fact that the crowd was cheering when Donald Trump said that. Understand the impact that Donald Trump is having on American culture. He's getting his far-right followers to embrace violence, to not just warm up to the idea of doing violence against the other side, but to celebrate it when it takes place. Because everything that they do by definition is bad because they are the enemy. It is us versus them. Remember that. And he reinforces this time and again. He is deeply, deeply dangerous. And what he is encouraging here is... <sighs> I worry about what's going to happen. Now, I hope that, you know, all of my concerns are unfounded and, you know, voters are able to make their voices heard democratically with uh, no issues whatsoever. But am I naive to think that that's going to be the likely scenario that plays out? Uh, naive enough to believe that, I should say. Uh, no, I think that we're probably not going to see everything go smoothly. I think that Donald Trump will ramp up fear-mongering depending on where he is, according to polls, towards the election. And we will maybe see far-right thugs show up to intimidate people at polling stations with guns. I mean, if they show up to intimidate Black Lives Matter protesters, you know, under the guise of protecting property and stopping looters, is it really that ridiculous to think that maybe they'd show up to um, protect democracy from cheaters? Not at all. Not at all. And, you know, I am hesitant to even talk about this because I don't want to put this idea into people's heads if they didn't already have it. But I just, I see where we're headed and the trajectory that we are on looks bad. It looks really bad. And I worry. So I talk about this to warn people to um, be prepared because... We have no idea what Donald Trump and his goons are going to try. 2020 Donald Trump is much different than 2016 Donald Trump because in 2016 Donald Trump was an actual outsider. So when he claimed that he was anti-establishment, he actually had a little bit of credibility. But now that he's in power and now that he's in that DC bubble that he once criticized, he's a different person. He doesn't know what to say to appeal to the voters he won over in 2016. And as a result, he keeps shooting himself in the foot. And it's astonishing to me that there aren't more people around him who at least try to rein him in, at least for purposes of self-preservation. Because we just passed a gigantic milestone, a really disturbing milestone when it comes to COVID-19. 200,000 deaths in America. Now, I am a little bit worried, honestly, that as that number grows, people will become more and more insensitized, desensitized, I should say, um, because, you know, there's a difference when, when you see that one person died and there's a face to it, you know, that really does have a different sort of impact on us at an individual level. But when we just see like these giant numbers, like 30,000, 100,000, 200,000, that is a little bit more difficult to grasp. So I worry that people will become more desensitized as the number grows. But regardless, it's still a really disturbing milestone. And uh, Donald Trump did the dumbest thing imaginable to draw attention to the fact that we just passed this milestone by downplaying COVID-19 at a rally by saying the dumbest thing ever as we reach this milestone. Take a look. Oh, the disease, we didn't know it. Now we know it. It affects elderly people, elderly people with heart problems and other problems. If they have other problems, that's what it really affects. That's it. You know, in some states, thousands of people 
Nobody young. Below the age of 18, like nobody. They have a strong immune system. Who knows? You look at you. Take your hat off to the young, because they have a hell of an immune system. But it affects virtually nobody. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. By the way, open your schools. Everybody open your schools. It affects virtually nobody. By the way, open your schools. He says this as we pass 200,000 deaths. If you said this when we were at like 185, there would be less attention drawn to it. Still a lot of scrutiny, but nonetheless not as bad as you say this as we cross this milestone. He just keeps shooting himself in the foot. And you can argue that he said a lot of idiotic things back in 2016 that should have theoretically ended his campaign when he said that Obama and Hillary Clinton founded ISIS. I thought that was stupid. When we got the grab him by the pussy tape, I thought that was pretty devastating. You know, uh, after you have woman after woman after woman accuse him of sexual assault or misconduct, you know, you think that at some point it'd have an effect. But, you know, um, still, after all of those things that he said in 2016 that were bad, he still said enough things that made it seem as if he could still be an agent of change, even if he would bring chaos with said change, that, you know, people decided to overlook all of those weird things about Donald Trump. But now, four years later, when we have this economic depression brought on by a global pandemic that none of us have, have ever had to deal with, I mean, things are different now. Now, when you shoot yourself in the foot, I think it actually will hurt you more. Does that mean that he's going to lose? Not necessarily. I still think that, you know, currently, as it stands now, according to public opinion polls, Biden is the favorite to win. Um, but, you know, Trump's not out of it, but he keeps doing things to isolate voters, uh, to piss people off. He just can't help himself. He just can't help himself. And what worked back in 2016, like just being a loudmouth idiot, that might not work in 2020. Now, as I'm watching this, like I, I can't help but think, who wants to watch this and listen to this old man just babble on for hours at a time? Like he's not saying anything. He's not talking about anything meaningful. He's not addressing anything. Like why would you go to a political rally if there's almost never any policy discussed? Like he just talks about who's mean to him. Like it's not even entertaining. Like I'm tired of the shtick. I'm tired of the, oh, Trump said this. It's kind of funny. I I'm just over it. How do you go to this and enjoy yourself? Like, if you go to a stand-up comedy show, you laugh. You expect that. If you go to a concert, you expect to be entertained by music. But when you go to this, what do you get? You don't get policy. You don't get substance. So what's the point? Like, I, I don't understand how people can tolerate this and put up with Donald Trump. But regardless, he keeps having these rallies where he says idiotic things. And, I, you know, I think... Maybe it's wishful thinking, but I think it's going to hurt him more than it did in 2016. But, you know, we'll wait and see because who knows? You know, there's a chance he says whatever and gets away with it because the news cycle moves on pretty quickly. I mean, just the week before last, he had this huge scandal that should have ended his presidency, not just his campaign, but his presidency, where the Bob Woodward tapes confirmed he knew about the severity of COVID-19, but downplayed it anyway, like Nobody's even talking about that. So maybe it's the case that even if he's shooting himself in the foot, it doesn't matter because, you know, he could absorb these blows. It, it doesn't matter. But I don't know. I think that at a time when people want a leader to get us out of this mess, out of this pandemic, you can't be saying shit like this. 200,000 Americans are dead and you're saying it affects virtually nobody. I mean, you can lie so much and, you know, people expect you to lie because you are a compulsive liar. But when you start lying... And you expect all of us to buy into what is obviously delusions of grandeur. I, I think that that is different. Or I hope it's different. It should be different. Like, America has embraced stupidity and anti-intellectualism with Donald Trump's presidency. So, you know, maybe it's the case that we've been programmed and conditioned to just accept stupidity from Donald Trump. And when he says something stupid, you know, the average American just scoffs or laughs at it because it's Trump. He's going to be Trump. But, you know... When I see this, and he says that COVID-19 affects virtually nobody, by the way, open your schools as we lost 200,000 Americans, I can't help but think this has got to hurt him. He's shooting himself in the foot. I mean, again, having a big mouth is uh, really great if you are trying to appeal to people and convince them that you're an outsider. You're not a traditional politician. But nowadays, I just I can't see how this is going to to help him where it's necessary, like his diehards, the cultists, 
they're going to love this. But like the people who flipped from Obama to him in 2016, I can't imagine this is going to resonate with them. I think this is going to turn them off, if anything. But again, who knows? As much as I cannot wait for this election to be over, I will admit that I am kind of looking forward to the upcoming debates between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And the first one is approaching very, very soon. It will take place on Tuesday, September 29th, tomorrow by the time most of you see this video. And um, I have a lot of expectations. I think this is probably going to be the most explosive event because I think that both of the candidates know that most people will be tuning in to this debate. And um, so, yeah, I kind of want to share what we can expect based on the discussions or the topics that will come up for discussion. And I also want to give you my thoughts about uh, what to expect. Uh, so first, Bloomberg reporter Emma Kennery explains topics for the first presidential debate next Tuesday have been released. The debate will be moderated by Fox News' Chris Wallace, and this is what will be discussed. Uh, the records of both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, the Supreme Court, highly contentious issue currently, COVID-19, probably the most important issue to voters, the economy, race, and violence in our cities, and the integrity of the election. Now conspicuously absent from this debate, climate change. Really important. Healthcare. If Trump actually gets his way and gets a third Supreme Court nominee approved, that means that the conservatives on the court will have a 6-3 majority and ACA's on the table. Right now, it doesn't seem like they would strike it down with Roberts if we can assume he will side with the liberals again. Um, it'd just be uh, deadlocked. But if if he gets this nominee through, the ACA is on the table. So we need to talk about health care. Not only because people around the country could lose protections for pre-existing conditions, but during a pandemic where people are losing their jobs and as a result losing their employer-based health insurance. I think this is something that needs to be discussed, but I hope these topics come up at a future debate. The way that this is supposed to be structured is each of these topics will be discussed at length for about 15 minutes each. So I think that this format is a little bit more conducive to a substantive discussion. Although when we're talking about uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, you know, we're going to basically see talking points compete against one another, and it might be a little bit insufferable, but I do think it will be entertaining at a minimum. Um, now, before we get to my expectations, uh, we do have three debates taking place in October. So after this debate, the next debate will take place on Wednesday, October 7th, and this is actually the vice presidential debate between Kamala Harris and Mike Pence, moderated by Susan Page of USA Today. And after that, Steve Scully of C-SPAN moderates the second presidential debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, which will be a town hall style debate on Sunday, October 15th. And finally, the third and last debate will occur on Sunday, October 22nd, and will be moderated by Kristen Welker of NBC News. Now, overall, broadly speaking, going into these debates, Joe Biden still has a solid lead over Donald Trump, both nationally and in battleground states. So what we have to see happen in order to see the trajectory of this race change is Donald Trump doesn't just have to have a good performance. Joe Biden also has to have a bad performance because if both Donald Trump and Joe Biden are competent cognitively speaking, then I think that it's not really going to change the direction of this race. But if it's a disaster and Joe Biden face plans, I can see that tipping, you know, the scales back in Trump's favor. Um, now, I kind of want to go through each of these subjects because I think that there's some areas where, you know, Joe Biden will have an advantage and there's other areas where, where Donald Trump could be seen as the winner. So when it comes to their records, they both have absolutely abysmal records. I think that, you know, Joe Biden can win if he hits Donald Trump on COVID-19 and how he bungled that response. Now, Joe Biden is a little bit more savvy than Hillary Clinton, and he is using some populist rhetoric on the campaign trail to appeal to the voters that Democrats lost in 2016. So this one, I kind of see it as it could go either way. But when it comes to the Supreme Court, I do think that this is an area of opportunity for Joe Biden. He can really 
win and dominate here by showing how hypocritical Donald Trump and the Republicans are. Because even if you and I, who are in the trenches, already know that Mitch McConnell and Republicans are hypocrites, I mean, does the average voter know that? I don't know. Now, COVID-19, if Joe Biden plays his cards right, this should be a bloodbath for Donald Trump. Do not let him get away. We already know what Donald Trump is going to say. I acted fast. You know, I did the travel ban to China when you said no. Joe Biden has to move on from that, explain why we all thought that. It's because Donald Trump is the one who downplayed the severity of COVID-19 after he knew how serious it was. I mean, if Joe Biden messes this up, I will be outraged because this is like, this is a softball, right? They're, teeing, they're throwing that right down the middle for you. So, uh... Joe Biden better dominate this. When it comes to the economy, I think that Donald Trump, because he's so braggadocious, will have the edge here. Although, if Joe Biden is able to capably respond to Donald Trump talking about how, you know, uh, the stock market is doing well and actually explain to people that the stock market isn't an indicator of how average Americans are doing, Joe Biden can actually do well here. Now, when it comes to race and violence in our cities, I think that Trump has the potential to appeal to these white suburban voters that the Democratic Party has been trying to win over by saying, look, you see all of this chaos in the streets, you know, this is something that, you know, the Democrats support. I don't support this. This is law and order. But at the same time, you know, Joe Biden can say, look, this is all happening on your watch. You're declaring certain cities like Seattle and Portland anarchist jurisdictions. So are you saying that you're not a competent leader? If the country is devolving into anarchy. Like, he can really play around and clown on Donald Trump here. Um, I don't know if he's going to be effective at doing that, but if Joe Biden can at least show a little bit of sensitivity to the issue of race and criminal justice, then he can, he can do a really good job here and at least show voters that he's more in tune to the protests and what people want and the need for criminal justice reform than Donald Trump is, and police reform more specifically. Now, when it comes to the integrity of the election, I think that Joe Biden can really show that Donald Trump is full of shit here. He just has to prove not just that mail-in voting is safe, but that Republicans are actively engaging in voter suppression. They are actively engaging in voter suppression and this is happening all across the country, and it's making it more difficult for people to make their voices heard, which is why a minority party is, uh, you know, in power, controls all of government. So, you know, for each of these topics, I kind of I kind of feel like overall, Joe Biden has the advantage based on what they're going to be discussing. But at the same time, Biden's going to be on point. He can't be making too many gaffes. Whatever his uh, aides gave him at that debate between Bernie Sanders and him, I don't know if, you know, they got him hyped up on sugar, you know, uh, give gave him a little bit of Coke. <laughs> I'm, of course, talking about Coca-Cola. Uh, whatever it is, he's got to bring that. Bring that same energy to this debate because you can't afford to fuck up the first debate. If you fuck up this debate and out of the gate look like you're in, you know, really severe cognitive decline if you're having one of your bad days... I mean, that could change the direction of this race. Trump could get momentum. And sometimes when you get momentum, it's sort of like a snowball effect. It just keeps grow growing. So this debate especially, Biden has to come prepared. I think that the second VP debate, if we have, you know, Joe Biden perform competently at this first debate, I think Kamala Harris will do a, a pretty good job against Mike Pence. You know, when she actually tries, she does a great job debating. I've seen some pretty horrible debate performances, you know, particularly towards the end of uh, her campaign in 2019. But if she actually brings the energy that she brought to that first debate that she uh, did in the Democratic Party primary, she can obliterate Mike Pence. Like, she is a good debater. She just has to come prepared, and I think that she will. Um, but so long as Biden has a good first performance and Kamala Harris is able to back him up with a solid second performance by debates two and three, where you have a more town hall style, well, that one isn't going to be as intense. And by the time, you know, it's uh, the third debate, I think that there's going to be some people who are just already tuning out the election. They've made their decision. But then, you know, the last minute voters are going to see, you know, both of the candidates make their last pitch and this will be the last impression that they get. But I think as long as Joe Biden has a good start, then that's not going to be enough to change the momentum, right? Um, in Trump's direction, that is. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, either way, I expect to be entertained. 
But uh, Joe Biden's aides better get him prepared. He should be practicing day and night, have everything he says be rehearsed. Like, he can't afford to fuck this up. Like, I've said this, I sound like a broken record, but if you face plant out of the gate, it's going to be bad. So uh, just maintain that lead. You know, Donald Trump is going to be trying hard because he knows he's losing currently. So make sure you come prepared. And um, I think you'll be okay so long as you don't absolutely make a fool of yourself, Joe Biden. Not that he's watching, but um, he better bring it. Turns out there will be no justice for Breonna Taylor. So as AP reports, a Kentucky grand jury brought no charges against Louisville police for the killing of Breonna Taylor during a drug raid gone wrong, with prosecutors saying Wednesday that two officers who fired their weapons at the black woman were justified in using force to protect themselves. Wow. The only charges brought by the grand jury were three counts of wanton endangerment against fired officer Brett Hankison for the shooting into Taylor's neighbor's homes during the raid on the night of March 13th. The FBI is still investigating potential violations of federal law in the case. Ben Crump, a lawyer for Taylor's family, denounced the decision as outrageous and offensive. And protesters shouting no justice, no peace began marching through the streets. Some sat quietly and wept. Later, scuffles broke out between police and protesters, and some were arrested. The announcement of the charges drew immediate sadness, frustration, and anger that the grand jury did not go further. The wanton endangerment charges each carry a sentence of up to five years. Right after the decision, protesters brought cases of water to Injustice Square, the Louisville Park where people have gathered to demand justice for Taylor. Some began preparing food. Later, police in the city cordoned off a street with yellow tape and officers with protective gear could be seen handcuffing some people. Some scuffles broke out and police ordered a group that broke off from the protests to disperse, warning that chemical agents might be used if they didn't. Now, Hayes Gardner, a reporter for Career Journal, actually uh, has some video footage that he posted to Twitter of this scene, what's being described here. And as you're going to see, the police officers are very obviously trying to intimidate people who are doing nothing, who are just standing there and being peaceful. Take a look. So I guess that people just aren't allowed to peacefully assemble. Did you see anyone doing anything wrong? Anything that can be described as violently protesting? Rioting? Of course not. This is what they are doing because they know that they just killed a black woman and they're getting away with it and they know people are going to be angry. And so what they're doing is uh, trying to use brute force to intimidate people into not doing anything. Because this is kind of like a tacit message. Hey, we got away with killing Breonna Taylor. And best believe we'll get away with killing you too if you choose to uh, protest and get angry about it. Doesn't matter if it's on camera. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. We can literally break into your home and kill you and get away with it. What are you going to do about it? That's the message that I get when I see this as they threaten people, as they walk through, you know, the streets with handcuffs strapped to his side, ready to just arrest people. They have all of the power. You have no constitutional rights anymore, apparently, because they could just do whatever they want. I mean, think about how devastating this is. Police officers in her own home murdered her, and they're getting away with it. The only charges that we're seeing are for wanton endangerment. Breonna Taylor's life wasn't endangered. It was taken away. She was killed. And these police officers are... Uh, gonna get away with it and the only charges that are being uh lobbed against that one officer brett hankinson uh hankison 
is um because he fired his weapon uh into the neighbor's walls i don't know what to say there's really no words for things like this i just feel sadness um i think that maybe because you know the circumstances were so extreme that she was killed by police in her own home maybe there was just a small chance that there would be justice in this instance but i mean this sends a message to people that it doesn't matter what the circumstances are you could be doing nothing and police can kill you with impunity and get away with it i mean what's left to say there's no justice in america there's no justice the justice system is a complete failure and we need to absolutely do away with the system that allows for this to go on where a human being a black woman in her own home sleeping can be killed and nothing happens police officers get away scot-free it's just there's no words there's no words i think the lawyer uh put it best this is outrageous and offensive because it is so i mean i don't i don't know what to say i'm a little bit sho shocked um even though like it's not surprising but it's still like to see it again it, it's like really they're really just going to get away with this when they killed her in her own home it's just it feels like nothing matters the laws don't matter the constitution doesn't matter because black americans aren't protected police officers can kill them and get away with it and it doesn't matter the circumstances at all they just nothing matters at a recent rally, Donald Trump was talking about Minnesota, which is a state where Representative Ilhan Omar is from. And so, of course, you know, since she's been a target of his in the past, he, is, he decided to bring her up. And what he says about her is so disrespectful, so outrageous, so brazenly xenophobic and racist that it's shocking even for Donald Trump. Like, it shouldn't be shocking, but it still is because you'd think for how big of a mouth he has, you know, there's still got to be some mechanism in his brain that gets him to shut up about certain things that he's thinking. But no, he said the quiet part out loud again. Uh, but thankfully, um, I think that she hit back in a way that is, uh, is satisfactory, to say the least. But first, this is what he said about her. We're going to win the state of Minnesota because of her, they say. He's telling us how to run our country. How did you do where you came from? How is your country doing? They're going to tell. She's going to tell us. She's telling us how to run our country. That was extremely racist. I mean, I don't know what else to say about it. That was extremely racist. And I know Republicans are going to say, how is he racist? How is he racist, Mike? He's literally saying, oh, she's telling us how to run our country, implying that this isn't her country. Fuck you. This is her country. This is her country. She is an individual who is emblematic of the American dream. Like, I think the American dream is dead. But if you want to get Americans to think that it's still alive, then you'd point to someone like Ilhan Omar, who came to this country as a refugee from Somalia and ended up becoming a member of Congress. Like, that is the American dream. Like, you should be celebrating her if you are a patriotic American, as Trump and his supporters claim to be. But he's saying... Who does she think she is? She's telling us how to run our country? This isn't her country. How dare she tell us what's good for us? This immigrant, this black person telling us how to run our country. That's what he's trying to communicate to his racist followers. And if you can't see it, you're just, you're blind. Now, um, what's ironic is that she is um, much more competent and capable than Donald Trump could ever be. She could run the country better than Donald Trump. She actually has policy prescriptions to the issues that we're dealing with. She supports policies that are very popular. So rather than scoffing at her telling you how to run your country, maybe you should shut the fuck up and listen to her because she actually knows more than you about this. But I don't have to speak very long because I think that she really offered the best defense for herself 
and her clapback was just, it, it was A++. So she responded on Twitter saying, firstly, this is my country, and I am a member of the house that impeached you. Damn. Secondly, I fled civil war when I was eight. An eight-year-old doesn't run a country even though you run our country like one. <laughs> She then followed up saying, these cult-like rallies leave me wondering one thing. And she then shared a gif from Mean Girls with Regina George saying, why are you so obsessed with me? Damn. <laughs> I love Ilhan Omar. Like, she brings the fire and she lets all of this shit and toxicity from Donald Trump roll off of her back. But honestly, like, I don't know how she takes it. She's probably my favorite member of Congress. And I don't know how she is able to... To withstand all of these attacks. I mean, she gets death threats regularly. She gets attacked by the president in a racist manner, explicitly so, on a semi-regular basis, and still she can laugh about it and share a gif from Mean Girls. I don't know how she has the willpower to go on. I just don't, which is why I respect her so much, which is why she's such an inspiration to me, which is why she's my favorite member of Congress, because she puts up with more bullshit than anyone, perhaps in the history of Congress in recent history, has had to put up with. I mean, nobody else deals with this. Nobody else does. I mean, you see AOC, you know, withstand sexist attacks, you know, uh, Republicans calling her stupid and whatnot. But Ilhan Omar, she gets death threats. People in her own district are, you know, threatening to harm her. And you have the president attacking her and she still goes on. She still keeps fighting. She never backs down. She always stands strong. I mean, if Ilhan Omar isn't a leader, nobody is. She expresses all of the qualities that you look for in a member of Congress. And honestly, if there are more people like her running this country, we'd be in a much better place. And this is her country. I'm glad that she re reiterated that. It's obvious, but you have to say it. This is her country. It's not something that belongs to oligarchs like Donald Trump, who were born with a silver spoon in his mouth, who created businesses off of daddy's money. This is more her country than it is your country. And go fuck yourself, Donald Trump. Like, the things that he says are just outrageous. And even if we're all desensitized at this point because it's Donald Trump and he always says stupid things, we shouldn't become accustomed to this, where he is openly attacking a member of Congress and literally saying, you're telling us how to run our country. She's literally running the country. She's in Congress. You absolute fucking tool. I'm just sick of Donald Trump. I'm over it. Um, but, you know, credit to Ilhan Omar for bringing that fire and responding and just never backing down. I really respect her. As the election gets closer, a lot of us are thinking about ways that things could go uh, very, very wrong even if Joe Biden wins. So, um, you know, there's the prospect of Donald Trump just refusing to concede and refusing to uh, step down come Inauguration Day. We've talked about this before in the program. But there's also the uh, red mirage scenario that could play out and cause sheer chaos throughout the country. If on election night, it seems like Donald Trump is in the lead, but then that lead diminishes as mail-in ballots come in because Democrats are more likely to vote by mail during a pandemic. So it would tip the scales to Joe Biden, and then Trump could claim Biden's stealing this election. Democrats are stealing this. His supporters could take to the streets, and chaos could unfold. But aside from those two scenarios, the most frightening that I've heard of yet involves Donald Trump remaining in power even if Joe Biden beats him. Donald Trump could actually use the Electoral College to steal this election. And we're not talking about, you know, the 2016 scenario where Hillary Clinton got more votes overall, but he still won because he won in the right places, in the right states. No, we're talking about him staging what is effectively a coup. His team literally has a contingency plan to remain in power if Joe Biden wins and it's close. So there's an article in The Atlantic by Barton Gelman that lays all of this out pretty clearly, calling this situation, if it in fact comes to fruition, the election that could break America. And he argues if the vote is close, Donald Trump could easily throw the election into chaos and subvert the result. Who will stop him? And Gelman is pretty clear that the answer is nobody. 
could stop it. Because our constitution has a lot of mechanisms in place to stop a dictator from holding on to power. But here, if Trump's legal team actually does what they want to do here by using the Electoral College to basically flip the result in his favor, even if Biden beats him, there really is no fail-safe in our constitution. There's no law that protects us from him using this method to steal the election. Now, this is a really long and comprehensive article. I'm going to link to it down below. When I read this, it was so terrifying, it sent chills down the back of my neck. That's how scary it is, but it's too long for the show. So instead, we're going to go to a summary written up by Eric Lutz of Vanity Fair, because I think he does a fair job at concisely laying out Gelman's argument here. So he explains, Donald Trump has been throwing everything he's got at the 2020 election to ensure a favorable result or otherwise undermine the outcome, sowing doubt in the legitimacy of mail-in ballots, screwing with the postal service that will handle them, trying to recruit law enforcement as poll watchers, flirting with delaying the election and openly stating that he won't accept any results he doesn't like. Now, the Trump campaign is said to be considering another, even more outrageous approach approach in a thorough and deeply disconcerting piece about the constitutional crisis that may await us between November 3rd and the inauguration in January, The Atlantic's Barton Gelman reports that the Trump campaign has been discussing contingency plans to bypass the election results and appoint local electors in battleground states where Republicans hold the legislative majority. Citing the president's baseless claims of fraud, Team Trump could ask GOP-controlled state governments to choose electors, completely ignoring an unfavorable or uncertain popular vote, state and national Republican sources told Gelman. The state legislatures will say, all right, we've been given this constitutional power, a Trump campaign legal advisor explained to The Atlantic. We don't think the results of our own state are accurate. So here's our slate of electors that we think properly reflect the results of our state. Does completely ignoring the will of voters seem anti-democratic, unconstitutional, impossible? One would think, but as Gelman points out, however authoritarian this kind of end around may seem, the Constitution doesn't forbid such a move, and it's something the Trump campaign could pull off. Indeed, state Republican leaders have already casually indicated that they'd be all too happy to enable this kind of power grab. I've mentioned it to them, and I hope they're thinking about it too. Lawrence Tabas, chairman of the Republican Party in Pennsylvania, one of the swing states on which the 2020 race could hinge, told Gelman, it is one of the available legal options set forth in the Constitution. So I want to repeat, Trump could take these uh, swing states, these battleground states that are controlled by Republicans, and if the result doesn't go the way that he likes, if he cries fraud, he can say, all right, I want to give uh, the Electoral College our own set of electors that my goons choose to vote in my favor, undermining the will of voters in that state. And the Constitution, as Gelman points out, does not protect us from this level of blatant rat fuckery. So if Trump chooses to, to do this, if it's close enough, he could literally steal the election from Biden and remain in power. Now, Gelman talks about the possibility that Trump wouldn't do this. For those of us entertaining the likelihood of this, he already has the contingency plan being discussed, and Republicans are talking about it. They would be willing to do this. Uh, but would Trump actually do something like this? Would he, like, refuse to concede? Well, you have to think about this. Gelman makes a phenomenal point about the fact that even in 2016, when Trump beat Hillary Clinton, he didn't accept the results. Because remember, Hillary Clinton beat him by almost 3 million votes. But he won the Electoral College, which is how you win. But he wouldn't even accept that. He wanted people to think that he won the popular vote as well. So he said, well, you know what? If you take into account all of the um, illegal votes that took place, I would have won the Electoral College and the popular vote. So after he already did this, after he set this precedent for himself, is it reasonable to assume he's going to reject the results and possibly do something like this? Yeah. Now, during a White House press briefing, Donald Trump was asked whether or not he would attempt to commit to a peaceful transferal of power. And his response should horrify you because he says he will not. Win, lose, or draw in this election, will you commit here today for a peaceful 
transfer uh, of power after the election. And there has been rioting in Louisville, there's been rioting in many cities across this country, red and your so-called red and blue states. Will you commit to making sure that there is a peaceful transfer Pearl of power after the election. Well, we're going to have to see what happens. You know that I've been complaining very strongly about the ballots, and the ballots are a disaster. I and, understand that, but and, people are rioting. Do you oh, commit to making sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots, and you'll have a very trans. We'll have a very peaceful. There won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Uh, the ballots are out of control. You know it. And you know who knows it better than anybody else? The Democrats know it better than anybody else. Go ahead. He was asked, will you commit to a peaceful transfer of power? His answer, well, we're going to have to see what happens. This is very serious. I don't think there are the words to really describe how serious this is. But we could witness the most undemocratic thing in American history, so much so that this could be the end of democracy. Trump is already saying if he wins, he's going to, you know, see if he can negotiate a third term since Democrats were so mean to him. He is trying to make it so he stays in power. Even if he loses. I don't think people really understand What's at stake here and what's possible? Even if Joe Biden wins, Trump could still remain, remain in power. And this is what Republicans are planning to do. This is the contingency plan that they are disclosing publicly. They want people to know that this is what they're planning. Now, putting this aside, we hear Donald Trump at rallies, basically encouraging his supporters to intimidate people at the polls. I just, I don't know what to say about this. If you don't see what's happening and automatically know how serious it is, then you have to, you have to go beyond the United States and American electoral politics and look to dictatorships around the world and understand how democracy has broken down. And it's things like this. I've said this once, I'll say it again. Democracy is not something that will be with us forever. All democracies die at some point. Empirically speaking, all democracies come to an end. And just because we've been considered uh, considered a democracy for so long doesn't mean it's going to be with us forever. Trump is uh, possibly going to undermine democracy. And if he's willing to do this, if he clings to power using this method, do you honestly think he's going to stop there? Do you think he's going to stop consolidating power after he steals the election from Biden? No. So this is the most serious threat to democracy our country has ever had. And look, I'm willing to admit that I don't really consider America an actual democracy if we go by Robert Dahl's standards of polyarchy. Like, I don't think that you can consider a country a democracy if black people can't vote, if they are property, if women can't vote. But we have made progress over the years, and it's a constant battle to fight to maintain what we what we got like democracy is an ongoing fight you know you don't just arrive automatically at democracy you start somewhere and you keep building upon that and trump is threatening here to just trash all of that and um i'll be honest with you i live in a deep blue state i'm not gonna vote third party i'm voting for joe biden and um that pains me to say it, I was actually, um, you know, if I was going to vote for Joe Biden, I wasn't going to admit that because I don't want the Democratic Party to know that they have my vote no matter what. But at this point, the situation is so serious that I feel inclined to send a message that this type of fuckery is not acceptable. I don't support it. I want the margin to be as big as possible. And I'm not going to vote shame anyone because I don't believe in vote shaming. I, I think it's immoral and it is incumbent on Biden to win those votes. But if you do live in a swing state, I would reconsider voting third party if you were planning to. I know a lot of people who are third party voters, you know, this time, according to polls, probably won't be voting third party. But this is my this is my thinking before I had this philosophy that I would never even tell them or broadcast my intent to vote for them because I don't want them to think that I'll fall in line every time 
but this is just, this is so different. Like, and I live in a deep blue state, so really it's not that serious for me, but it's such a serious situation. The threat is so severe that Donald Trump poses that I have to vote against it, which, um, you know, coming to this realization makes me feel genuinely depressed, genuinely depressed. Like, I don't want to get out of bed. That's how bad the situation is. But, you know, there's um, there's not much else we can do about it. As shitty as Joe Biden is, you know, um, I don't believe he would do something like this. He has a lot of, you know, um, qualities about him that I loathe. I think, you know, the Democratic Party, when it comes to progressives, are genuinely undemocratic. But if Trump is able to do this and actually kill our democracy, then we won't even have the ability to make our voices heard in the future. There's no there's no vote for a politician that supports Medicare for all if this can happen. Because even if Trump steals this election from Biden and then doesn't run for a third term, you know, this opens the door to other Republicans doing this and even Democrats doing this. So you have to you have to draw the line somewhere. And this is my line. Like I wasn't planning on voting for Joe Biden in a deep blue state of Oregon, in a safe state. But now I've got to say fuck you to Donald Trump. He's pissed me off more than Joe Biden. And there's just, there's too much at stake to where I don't want to risk it. I'm not sure what else to say about this situation. It's just horrifying. Um, and the fact that Donald Trump is broadcasting his intent to potentially steal the election and he's saying, I'm not going to commit to a peaceful transfer of power. We'll have to wait and see. I just, I want you to brace yourselves for the chaos that will likely unfold um, come November. I am here with Paula Jean Swearingen, who just won her primary in West Virginia, and she is facing off against Shelley Moore Capito, a Republican. And um, I think she's going to pull this one off. Paula, welcome back to the program. Hey, Mike. Thank you for having me back. It's always good to be with you. It's always glad to uh, I'm always glad to have you on and talk about your campaign. So we have some excited news. Uh, you were just endorsed also by Bernie Sanders. Um, so give mm -hmm. us the update. There's lots of big things happening currently. Uh, what's going on? Um, tell us about the race. Uh, we've had incredible national uh, endorsements. Uh, We've Iron Stashes is, is helping us. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, Sen uh, Senator Nina Turner, um, uh, Andrew Yang has endorsed us. Uh, so we've had endorsements across the aisle, and people really stepping up for West Virginia. And right now, it's really incredible. We have a comprehensive uh, campaign team. We have about twelve on staff, and if people say that people-funded campaigns do not work. We have raised over a million dollars. The average donation is $26.30, and we almost outraised my opponent last qu quarter, even though she is funded by those dark funders. So, you know, if anybody says that money's not an issue, we've had so many people across the country, people that have had to leave the state that want to come back home, that have donated dollars and volunteered. And, you know, it's just, it's up to West Virginia now. Um, to help win this race because everybody has pulled out all the stops for West Virginia and I'm just so incredibly humbled and proud and our team has a comprehensive digital strategy. We sent over 80,000 texts last week. Um, we have a lot of secret weapons behind the scenes that I don't want to talk about, but everybody has been absolutely incredible. And the thing is about this campaign, it's led mostly by West Virginians. Uh, you know, I'm from Wyoming County. My campaign manager is a black hat coal miner and a trucker, and he is from Logan County, and he's leading the ship. And I can't tell you how proud that makes me um, to show that folks in the coal fields have teeth, shoes, and brains, and you can actually accomplish something. And I'm incredibly proud of my team. Yeah, this is astonishing. I think you're running a phenomenal campaign. Um, you're putting out ads all of the time. Like, this is a very, very active campaign. Uh, you could just see it like you're you're hungry. You all want to win. And 
I think that you guys are doing a phenomenal job. I do want to ask you, though, about the dynamics of this race, because knowing that there's an uh, open Supreme Court seat since Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, has that changed anything? Um, I know that Democrats collectively got over $100 million after RBG passed away last week. Um, and I'm wondering if there's been any extra attention paid to this race now, because um, now Shelley Moore Capito is likely, you know, she's going to vote to approve Donald Trump's um, nominee. So have you been able to use this? Is this an effective strategy that will play well in West Virginia? Like, what's your take on this situation? Well, my opponent's kind of cut off her own leg and all, all eyes are on her. And we don't hold her accountable enough because, you know, she sucks and we expect her to suck. But what she did in 2016, she said that uh, we should not have a uh, denomination process happening during an election. And she said that uh, West Virginia voters should be able to uh, put their vote in at the ballot box. But now she's saying that she's trying to push a nominee down our throats and she says she's going to do with what it, uh, whatever Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump wants to do. So West Virginia is a pretty ticked off. Um, because we know with her voting record in the past and voting for nominees that she's voted against the working class. And I see, you know, we see a lot of Republicans that are noticing not only is she a hypocrite, but she's a liar. And uh, she's pretty much cut off her legs. She's actually helped us. And, you know, we've had more support because of her poor decisions and her flip flopping like she does, even with COVID relief. She had the Heroes Act sitting on her desk for three months. She was drafting legislation um, and helped in craft the Heals Act, which would take this, which took away the $600 benefit to people that are unemployment on an on unemployment. And it was basically a slap in the face because she said that uh, it just was not an incentive for people to go back to work. So she essentially, to me, said that she was calling hardworking Americans lazy when they needed help the most. Also, she wanted to push people back into unsafe working conditions and not hold any liability to employers um, if someone got sick. When she came home, uh, they went into recess till after Labor Day, having that legislation on her desk, not pushing for anything. She came home with our governor, Jim Justice, had a $25,000 plated fundraiser, $11,500 for a photo op, while she was talking about pushing our children, our teachers, our public service personnel back into schools, while she was having digital press briefings with our governor, pretty much saying that she was out of touch and only thing she was worried about was serving her, cor you know, her corporate donors. She's never had to have a real job except for her political career. She's never had to wonder where her next meal is going to come from. So many things. She's proven over and over and over that she's out of touch with West Virginians, even tying into economic diversity, which you've talked to, you know, you've heard me talk about it over and over and how broadband, comprehensive broadband in this state plays a role in that. We, we know digitally it ties into our educational system pre-COVID and especially since COVID with her push to put children back into school, as well as our communications. She's trying to sell broadband to the highest bidder. She's trying to privatize it. We have seen over and over with broadband in this state, we've had companies that got state and federal funding and sent and spent it out of state. And instead of making it into a public utility, she's just put a for sale sign on our heads again, and especially our children right now that are so dependent on digital learning. And we have hotspots across the state where children can go and sit in the parking lot and download their work. And so it's it's like not taking care of the most vulnerable in our society because we're dealing with the addiction epidemic. So many people don't have rural transportation. So what are they going to do? They're going to push the most vulnerable children back into the classrooms in buildings that have poor ventilation systems. Our educators are doing everything that they can. But I know that I've talked to some educators that are talking about writing their wills and talking about what they're going to do if they get sick right now. And we have seen an uptick of COVID right now in West Virginia. And so many people are afraid and we are in the fight for our lives and we know it. And when I talk to my neighbor and ask him for a rent, he doesn't ask me if I'm a Democrat or Republican. He comes over and helps me and he brings that rich. And you hear me say all the time, we are some of the most united people um, 
in the country. I've never seen people united like we are in West Virginia. And we've made history, Mike. I don't know if people know because the national media is not talking about it. We had over 93 candidates in, candidates in this state with the West Virginia Can't Wait movement run for office this time. 43 of those candidates won their races. Every single Democratic nominee for Congress, the first congressional district, the second, the third, and United States Senate are women. We're all progressive. None of us take corporate PAC dollars, and we're ready to bust the halls of Congress and make sure that West Virginians have a seat at the table. It's a pivotal time in West Virginia, and I'm just so humbled and proud to be part of this movement. That's really encouraging. It seems like in West Virginia, what we're seeing is kind of a political realignment in a sense um, to where, you know, this common struggle across the state is really uniting people and these partisan differences that kind of um, characterize a lot of the um, chaos in other states. It's not necessarily prevalent in your state. And one thing that I wanted to ask you about, because you talked about how COVID-19 is affecting your state, is the eviction crisis, because Trump's moratorium on evictions expires after December mm -hmm. 31st. So on January 1st, there's going to be millions of Americans across the country who are going to be expected to pay months in back rent. And if that's not extended, if Trump, for example, loses this election and he kind of chooses not to act as a lame duck president, um, it's just going to be a disaster. So has Shelley Moore Capito done anything to attempt to ameliorate this crisis in her home state? Is she offering resources or even information to voters? Because I feel like this is such a huge disaster that it should be on the minds of every single member of Congress. And I just don't see that action. I don't see the urgency. So can you kind of speak to this? Because this is something that she has to at least be aware of. Well, the HEROES Act, like I said, it said on her desk, you know, she's got commercials out now. I was there for West Virginia. I voted for the first relief package, but also she's been pushing for corporate bailouts and big bailouts for real estate companies in the middle of a relief package. And she's not really pushing to help West Virginians. And this, we're one of the sickest and poorest states in the nation. And it's been proven statistically that we are the most impacted by COVID because of addiction, because of black lung, cancer, heart disease, uh, cardiovascular, I mean, uh, diabetes. Uh, we are just, with these people here are sick and poor and we have a large bulk of our population that is elderly. She's even tried to turn Medicare into a voucher program. When people ask her about Medicare for all, she thinks it's gonna be Medicare for none. When she tried to privatize Medicare and take you know, the Medicare that our elderly already have away from them and privatize it. And you know, like I said, put a for sale sign on it. She was the first woman to be elected to the United States Senate to represent the state of West Virginia. She's a mother and grandmother. She voted against equal pay for women at least three times. And West Virginians see the differences in this campaign and the difference with her, because this country girl does not want to go to DC. It's about survival. It's making sure that West Virginians have a seat at the table. And she has done nothing as a mother and grandmother and turned a blind eye on the children dying and starving in this state. I really want to ask her the question, how does she sleep at night? But she won't even debate me. Um, she's shying away from a debate because she knows that she's going to be called out for her years and years of being a corporate servant, getting rich off our backs. In 2008, you can make your own decision about this and your own assessment, but when the stock, mar the stock market uh, collapsed, her husband was selling stock the day before. Uh, so we know who she is. We know what's going on with her. She's there because of her dad's corrupt dynasty, and she continues with corruption across the state. And we have not given her enough heat. And it's time for a mother and a grandmother to actually make sure that our children have a chance to grow and thrive and have a future in our state for a change. Yeah, and I think that the reason why she doesn't want to debate you is because if you if you really juxtapose both of your campaigns and your messages, it's night and day. Uh, I think she would just be uh, landslided because like when you speak, you speak really thoroughly to all of the specific things that impact the people of West Virginia. You talk about how, you know, um, the issues that are already disproportionately affecting coal miners, for example, that intersects with COVID-19 and creates a bigger disaster. So if you were to ask her, Healthcare. What do we do? What's your plan? She wouldn't be able to answer that. And I wanted to ask you about that as well, because, you know, she doesn't have a plan for the eviction crisis. Um, does she 
have any sort of idea what she wants to do for healthcare reform because i mean trump over and over has been saying it's coming it's coming meanwhile we see nothing so are other republicans such as uh capito are they doing anything to ameliorate the healthcare crisis because assuming trump gets his new supreme court nominee approved then the aca is most likely going to be repealed which means that protections for patients with pre-existing conditions that goes away people in west virginia will be affected by that probably more so than others in the country because they are you know um uh, they experience black lung and whatnot from uh, being coal miners what has she said with regard to health care? I mean, has she just been silent? She just keeps on talking about protecting health insurance companies and framing it as she's going to protect health insurance. And even with this administration and with Trump's tax plan that went through, you know, what the bulk of our population is on Medicare and Medicaid already. And even though we still have the expansion for adult Medicaid in the state, the income criteria changed under this tax plan and our hospitals were already under red alert because people were having to go into the ER for basics like sinus infections because they were not covered under Medicaid anymore. Uh, so, you know, it's she's talking about putting more food into food banks, but she's not talking about how we can get people less dependent on food banks and making sure that they have a living wage and we have a diverse economy in this state. Actually, we had an endorsement from a newspaper called the Dominion Post, which is in Mon County, and they are very known to be conservative. And they really come out against her after we interviewed with them because it really brought up all the issues and how, and how out of touch she really is. And so many Republicans have come into the fold with this campaign we are in the fight for our lives and you know we want basic human rights and we want economic diversity we want long-term solutions to the addiction epidemic everybody deserves health care and those are basics the three top basics that all west virginians want and we don't have to agree or you know on everything but we've come up to a place in this country whether we have representatives it's not a football game first and foremost but if we do have a two-party system, we need people that are setting down and thinking about the people that they are supposed to serve instead of corporations and lobbyists and making sure that they have our best interest at heart. And that's why we've seen a movement on a local level to a federal level with West Virginia Can't Wait and brand new Congress because ordinary people are standing up and saying, hey, we just want to be representative for, represented for a change you know of the people by the people for the people that's what our government should be we can we don't have to agree on everything but we have to make sure that people are intended to represent us period and that's what's going on with my opponent i mean i've i've been angry at her for a long long time because she is a mother and grandmother and she's had mothers knocking on her door trying to get arrested in her office. We've had people throw paper airplanes over the top of the door to get her attention because she won't even, her staff won't even answer the door. And that's why even here and now, my telephone number is 304-894-7472. Nobody's gonna have to get arrested in my office to get attention. As a matter of fact, when I go to DC, I'm going to make sure all these people that have been working in the front lines of our communities trying to solve our problems have a seat at the table in writing legislation that impacts our daily lives and making sure that we do have true change and they do have a true voice in Washington. Yeah, and I think that you, you really put it perfectly. You said we don't have to agree on everything. And, you know, I think you've been really effective at putting out this message that it's really obvious that she just doesn't care. Like, it's not even like she has solutions that you disagree with. She just doesn't have solutions. She's not proposing anything. You just you see this ambivalence from her, which is just astonishing to me when we are facing an unprecedented level of crisis in this country with, you know, a global pandemic and the economic uh, depression resulting from that pandemic. So even if like I didn't agree with anything she proposed, at least by proposing something, there's at least some initiative like you're showing to us that you care. But we get nothing from her, which is astonishing to me, especially because this is an election year. She's seeking reelection. So it, it's it's shocking. Now, I basically she's showing up for photo ops. I think she got some legislation uh it passed for commemorative coins, but what does that do for the people yeah. in West Virginia? Uh, you know, she has it. You know, we hear Capito Connect for five and a half years. She's been talking about broadband in our state. 
where is it? You know, she's been in office in Congress for a long time. And look, you know, anybody with common sense can look around and look at our neighbors and look at our communities and say, if she really means what she says during election season, then how come we don't see it every day and it's not happening? And it's happened with so many of our incumbents in their state. And that's why so many people here are stepping up and running for office and raising hell because these people are not doing their jobs. And my slogan, investing in ourselves, that's what West Virginians are doing. If they're not going to do their jobs, we're coming to take them. We ain't taking it no more. Yeah, that's beautifully put. So I think that anyone who um, has been watching The Humanist Report for a while is already familiar with your campaign. They know about you. They support you. We're all rooting for you. So please help us help you. Let us know what you need from us. How can we help you if we live in West Virginia or not? Uh, What can we do to make sure that you beat her in November? We have to keep making those impressions. We need volunteers first and foremost. We sent over 80,000 texts last week. We need more people on the horn making those phone calls. You know, every dollar counts if people can still donate. We need to fundraise so we can get broadcast television. We know that she's going to take off her money and invest in that to reach voters. And, you know, it's not a problem of reaching voters. It's, it's you know, reaching voters to to we have to get them motivated to the polls as well as learning this campaign and knowing that I'm not a polished politician. I'm not here making campaign promises. I'm a mother and grandmother too. And I want to make sure that my grandchild can stay here and live here and grow. So, you know, let's get on the horn. This is go time. We're in the fight for our lives. I will be a federal representative, so I'll represent everybody across this country. And so this is not just about West Virginia. This is making sure no matter who our president is, we have a good, strong Congress, especially the Senate, especially with everything that's going on with the Supreme Court right now. We don't need a rubber stamp for blue or red. We need somebody that is going to put somebody in that seat that is actually going to do their job and make decisions for the American people. So there'll be links um, in the description box to uh, Paula's website for those watching. Please, I would encourage you to support her. Um, This is a fight for our lives. I I think that there's no other way to describe it. And by, by, you know, explaining it the way that you did, you really are phenomenal at articulating what's at stake. Like, this is this is everything so much. Um, is at stake. So uh, we are going to be rooting for you. Thank you so much for coming on the program. I look forward to speaking to you after you win. I think that's going to be really exciting. And uh, it gives us a little bit of hope, like you running, you winning your primary, it gives us hope. So thank you for that. And thank you for fighting for everyone, Um, not just in West Virginia, but around the country. We are absolutely looking to you, you know, as a source for inspiration. So uh, we love you, Paula. Thank you so much for coming on. We love you too, Mike. Thank you for uh, raising the voice of the voiceless and making sure that these campaigns get the coverage that they need because we, you know, the status quo, they're going to do everything they can to fight against us. And it's people like you that uh, we get the word out and, uh, you know, and people know about campaigns like ours and you've worked so hard and I've watched you grow since 2018 and I can't thank you enough. You inspire me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That means so much coming from you. You know, it's, it's a little bit shocking that um, campaigns like yours aren't getting national attention, you know, given what's at stake. Um, and mm-hmm. it's frustrating to me. So, you know, I feel like I have to try to fill that role as much as I possibly can. And, you know, it's just it's, it's nice to be able to um, even just do a little bit and talk to you and hopefully get people to recognize the importance of this race, because it's it's everything. It is everything. It's so important. Well, you know, I'm only one vote. So everybody needs, if they're looking at the dynamic in Congress, go to brandnewcongress.org, look at all the candidates that went through the primary, because I can go to D.C. and I can raise all the hell that I want, but we need votes to pass legislation. And so look at all these candidates and make sure that we are putting our support behind them so we can work with each other and actually bring change for a change. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's not just like getting one or two more people elected like this is changing the makeup of congress like this is we're we're thinking long term we're playing the long game now and your victory is absolutely crucial um and i think that my viewers at least you know uh they acknowledge that it's just a matter of getting everyone else to understand 
why these races are so important and why we have to elect people who are actually fighting for working Americans. Um, that's why we're rooting for you. So thanks so much for coming on. I won't keep you any longer because I know you've got to jet to your next interview. But thank you so much, Paula. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Mike. Have a good night. You too. Well, that's everything. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you are new to the show, consider subscribing and clicking the notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter at Humanist Report. I don't have a personal account, so the show Twitter is my personal account. And before we go, I want to send a shout out to all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping the show not just to survive, but thrive as well. You all are truly incredible. Thank you all so much. Uh, but that's all I've got. So I'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone.